This is Dregs One. Welcome to another episode of the History of the Bay podcast, sponsored by the good folks of Amoeba Music San Francisco. Support your local record stores. Also sponsored by the good folks at Dying Bree for some of this gear, as well as your graffiti supplies. Behind the lens today, we got D'Angelo. We got Rocky Vision. Shout out to King Set on vacation. We got Skino in the building, producing as usual. D.O., the man with the master plan behind the boards. And today, man, we got a very special guest. We got multiple special guests. This is an honor, man. I'm here with the entire Souls of Mischief crew, man. I had to look around and say, oh, shit, it's actually all four of them. Damn, this is real. Right on for coming through, fellas. Thank you, thank you. Good to be here. No, I appreciate y'all because y'all are busy and... um, you know, I don't usually do a long intro, but today I just want to say some things, man. When you talk about Bay Area hip hop, there's not enough of our our legends being included in the whole conversation of hip hop, not just regional, but these brothers right here, Souls of Mischief, the Hieroglyphics crew have been breaking down barriers since the beginning, getting respect for all of us, representing for all of us in places where a lot of us ain't showing up. And it's 2023, and they're proving that the words they spoke were true. It's 93 till infinity. We're standing here 30 years later after that drop, and these brothers are touring the world. 93 dates plus. I mean, God, who can say that, man? I'm just hoping that, you know, of course, we want people who already know, people who are fans. But for those who don't know, I hope you tune in and find out for you young artists out there who, who want to get into rap, who want to get into the game. This is what longevity looks like right here, man. So a lot of cats came and went. A lot of one-hit wonders, a lot of smash records, a lot of gold and platinum plaques. And they couldn't fill up a barn in Alabama 30 years after their first job. You feel me? These brothers is touring the world, 93 days. I can't, I don't even know how y'all do that. I can't even do like, I can't even go to the park for four hours. I'm done the next day, you feel me? I go to a show just to watch. I need, I'm, I'm napping all the whole next day. Y'all brothers is traveling, man. How, how does it feel like to be able to do that? To, I'm seeing y'all, sell, I'm looking at the tour schedule. I'm seeing the dates go up. It's like, oh, London. Oh, here's another date in London. Oh, that one sold out. Whoops, here's another one. I mean, y'all are selling out how does that feel, man? Thirty years later. Oh, it feels it feels fantastic. I mean, the concept that uh, you know, we, when you're 18, 17, making records, thirty, you, you feel like you wasn't put in the grave. A thirty year old, you know what I'm saying? Though, so to be thirty years after that, still doing it and still like doing it at a high level, I'm pretty sure we're better now than we were then. Is is incredible, you know? So when you when you travel the world and people. Not only the original fans, but really, I mean, most of the people at our shows are under 30. Right. You know, really under 25. Right. So, but they know all the words, et cetera. So, you know, shout out to streaming, I guess. But, like, it's, it's, it's an incredible feeling. And, I mean, we kept on saying it as humbling. Like, like, oh, man, we didn't realize that we had this sort of effect on people. And we, we just, we, you can't plan for something like this. So, it's, it's, it's a beautiful feeling. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing, man. I mean, it's it's really, it's truly inspiring, man. Uh, I mean, for me to have, have known y'all and, and, and been able to build with y'all and see y'all go out and do that, man, I mean, that's that's really motivating, man. So much respect on that. Right on, right on. And I appreciate y'all being here because this is the History of the Bay podcast and y'all have a long history. So it started in Oakland, California. And um, what, was that, what was it like for each of y'all growing up in Oakland and, and how did y'all first meet? Um man, uh growing up in Oakland was uh it was it was fun. It's that yeah, yeah, word up. Um growing up growing up in Oakland was I mean when you're a kid, wherever you're at is is fun no matter what the circumstances are. So um we kinda like, you know, we met as young young kids and um just you know, we grew up in the same neighborhood in, in same areas in East Oakland. A lot of us went to the same schools and um we all pretty much have connections from from younger age and um Hip hop was something that we all had in common. You know, back in the day, like it, it wasn't as big and and worldwide and engulfing as it is now. Talking about hip hop culture back at that point, it was really like a really 
super fringe. Like, you know, uh, if you were doing it, it was an odd type thing. And you, you and your handful of people that were actually doing hip hop were kind of, it's kind of like being like, you a goth over there, or you the smokers over there, or you the jocks over there, or all or, oh, the dudes over there trying to rap and shit. It was like, wasn't really something that people looked at as, as cool at all. And the people who really got into it, you really had to share a common interest because there was no other reason for y'all to even be hooked up like that, even clicking like that, unless it was, um, over something, some kind of unifying factor. And for us, hip hop was one of those things that we were just into at a very young age. So we grew up in Oakland, but with that as well as as something that that linked us together over time. And for those who don't know, like the, the climate of Oakland, especially the climate of Oakland in the 80s, mm-hmm. what, what was going on in the community at that time? Reganomics. <laughs> you know, uh, shady eight. You know, it was it was it was a lot of lot of negativity. You know what I mean? But that's what hip hop provided that that vessel for us to to escape that, and not have to be entrenched in that. You know what I mean? But it was really no way to no way to like completely escape it. You know what I mean? But. Um, you know, it it added to the season, and I feel like of our first record. You know, you can hear like us, you can hear where we came from in that record when you listen to it. But yeah, I mean, during that during that time, the eighties was definitely, as we know, was the was what people consider the dope era, the crack cocaine era, and we know that the CIA, um, you know, had something to do with that. You know what I'm saying? Bringing bringing those you know those those weapons of mass destruction into our neighborhoods. You know what I'm saying? So. It's well documented now at this point, but back then it was like, you know, the, the, you had the rappers, you had the you had the drug dealers, you had the break dancers, you had the graffiti crews, you know what I mean? And the drug dealers were actually playing the dope hip hop shit that we considered classic music. You know what I mean? It wasn't no separation. They was playing De La Soul. They was playing Too Short. They was playing Ice T. They was playing, um, you know, uh, uh, uh. Spoon, they was playing Sugar Hill Gang. They was playing, you know, the list goes on and on. So if hip-hop was unified in a way. It, back then, it was very unified. I mean, even though even though the West Coast, we, were, we, were on, we weren't out there. Like, people didn't really know our full story yet. People out here were completely receptive of the music that was coming from, from New York at that time. So you see everybody on gold things pulling up in the, in the 67 muscle car. You know what I'm saying? They were knocking Eric B and Rakim and Run DMC. And, you know, it wasn't like wasn't like we were only playing music from our demographic at that time. Hip hop was like one thing. So along with along with the, the rappers who we consider superheroes at that time, the dope dealers were kind of on the same page too. You know what I mean? They were they were idolized as well. But we we chose the fork in the road to go toward being MCs and being rappers and being being entrenched in hip hop. That's what's up. Yeah, I like how you put that. Just just that the hip hop being the soundtrack of what was going on at the time. Hey, Opio, I was listening to your first album the other day, and you had a line about getting robbed at Baskin Robbins. Mm, that's a true story. Is that true? What, what happened? I was working at Baskin Robbins over by Seminary by Mills Hoagies. <laughs> you know, a little high school job, high school or junior high? high I think school. it was, yeah. It was early was like high school. 15 years old, something like that, and... It was just a many scene. Somebody was, like, getting jumped across the street. <laughs> and I, I think I was going to, like, take the trash out. And it was like a dude kind of shadowing me. As soon as I got to the door, he just had the Tech 9 out, like, Shreep! and we was like, oh, you know what I mean? So, yeah, that that happened. He robbed you or he robbed the ice cream store? <laughs> he robbed the whole Baskin Robbins, 31 flavors. <laughs> he got all 31. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know what's funny about that story is that like we was already like clicked up when that happened. And when he was like, fuck that job, I was like, blood, they hiring? And I went down there and got his job. <laughs> no, no bullshit. I went down and got and got his job. Like the one that he was like, fuck that, I'm cool on this job. I was like, but okay. I went there, got the interview, and got him. <laughs> that was just some Oakland shit though. Yeah. But it was like, that ain't supposed to be normal behavior. And none of that story is supposed to be normal, but that's just what it was. That was mad normal for some shit that we that we was just around normally, you know? Yeah, yeah that, I mean, that's why I ask about it because that is just a, a fortunate part of life that becomes normal, but it, it goes into the music, like literally you being able to tell that story in a rhyme in, in one of your songs. 
And uh, when I when when people think of hieroglyphics crew, is it safe to say that Dell is the founder? Yeah, yeah. most yeah. definitely. That's the that's the Godfather. Yeah. He was yeah. the first one to be jump out there and you know be signed and all that. You know, Ice Cube is his first cousin, and he is also older than than us. Okay, he's about a couple years. So he he he. In many ways, he led the way. Mm-hmm. Just his philosophy on how to do music and just kind of like expand our imagination, you know, pushed us to to be more creative with the vocabulary words that we selected or have more courage to freestyle. And also just, he was just a, a straight individual. He wasn't trying to be like nobody else. So he also showed us that we could really truly be ourselves you know what I mean without trying to even though we we had MCs that we definitely appreciated and respected and revered we also knew that we couldn't be anything like them at all we had to be totally original and the best way to do that is just be yourself yeah I can see that because Dell has a voice that you can't really compare to other people in hip hop and I mean, even among yourselves, your whole crew, you guys all have individual voices. But I, I, to be honest, hearing you say that, I do see a little bit of Dell in all y'all, just like the flow patterns and like you say, in the vocabulary. And um, that's cool that he was pushing y'all to be individuals. That's the big homie. Like, that's the big, that's our older partner. You know what I'm you saying? You can snatch that thing. Like, yeah. Dell is the big homie. You know what I'm saying, though? Like, it's like... He was ahead of us, you know. So he, him, you know, him and Domino are older than us. So they really, as far as follow, you know, like somebody to follow and lead an example. That's that's those are the guys, you know. And they and 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 they knew what like we were fortunate to have those kind of uh, big homies because they knew what they were dealing with. Like they were late. They saw the fire in us and 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 the skills in us. Like all the way back for, to to Sir Jinx, he was like, I knew y'all was gonna be stars when I knew when I met y'all. Like Easy E wanted to sign us. So like having older homies. To, we're just young cats, you feel me? We just trying to get it. Having older homies that can like see that potential in in us and and foster that and kind of guide it. That, that's been invaluable to us, even to this day. You know, we're contemporaries, but those are the big homies. So you know, always. Yeah, yeah for sure. So like, uh, I mean, obviously Dell had uh, a lot of talent early on. Besides just being Ice, it wasn't like he was just Ice Cube's cousin. Him being Ice Cube's cousin was just happened to happen be that way. He was that wasn't who he was. Like he he like we've been friends with him. Like I've known Dell since first grade. So he, he would oh that was his cousin that rap that's his cousin O'Shea from L. A. That wasn't even Ice Cube yet before when we he was Ice Cube. before he was mm-hmm. Ice Cube. As a matter of fact, when we were first doing a beat, a music with Jinx and them, Ice Cube was in a group with Jinx called CIA. Right. It was uh, it was KD. Dad's it was K D, um, Ice Cube. And Sir Jinx was the DJ slash slash producer. And this is like right before they started doing the NWA shit because Sir Jinx is Dr. Dre's cousin. That's how they all knew each other. So he wasn't even Ice Cube yet. He was like, Dell used to be on the phone and, and they used to say raps to each other back and forth because they were both cousins that rapped. That was really how you how we viewed him. Like when he, when he ended up being Ice Cube, we were all like, oh shit. But it wasn't like we got to know Dell because of that. We knew who he was already. And and then that happened. So like some lightning in a bottle shit, right place, right time shit. But we were already like fucking with Dell like completely by the time Ice Cube turned out to be Ice Cube. It's just like as much as we worked and prepared ourselves, there's some real lucky ass God's hands shit going on with our movement. You know what I'm saying? We who who would have known Dell's cu- cousin would have turned into Ice Cube? Like that's oh, just yeah. some like, that's just a blessing that came our way. You yeah, know what I mean? That's sick. I Crazy. Mean, it also just like speaks to like probably the small circle of people who was actually rapping back then yes. from yeah. L.A. to the Bay. It wasn't like it everybody. Wasn't it, it wasn't even cool to the girls if you was a rapper. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and like the hood, at the like on some regular hood shit at school back then, there was like one rapper who was already popular. He knew one rap and he would say that one rap <laughs> whenever anybody asked him to rap and mm-hmm. he didn't take the shit seriously and he probably was a D-boy too, but maybe not. And that was as far as like, if it was more than one of them at the school, it was corny to people. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you ain't, 
DeMarco, Bar- DeMarco's a rapper at the school or whatever the fuck, you know what I'm saying? So if you was with the rest of your homies trying to rap, it wasn't really looked at as a popular thing. People would even kind of be like, all oh, these weird ass niggas rapping and shit. It wasn't, it, it didn't have, the psychology of being a rapper was like, most, it, it, it was really a super minority sport. You, you know, you uh, it wasn't a whole lot of, uh, of motherfuckers that even listened to hip hop that much to even w- want to try to rap. It's hard to put it in that perspective, but it was really like that. I'm sure you remember. Mm. So it was like degree. playing lacrosse or some shit. Yeah, you see what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, though? Like yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't like Dungeons and Dragons you know, or something Dungeons, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It was, it wasn't somewhere. <laughs> full, and, and then really, until the rappers started imitating the drug dealers with their style and having the big chains and big cars and all that, which is them imitating the drug, like the dudes who was throwing the shows. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like being a rapper wasn't even something that, you know, it wasn't even economically viable. It was, it was like, oh, it, it was, you, you're into that and you want to do it, but it ain't like being a rapper was a cool thing. Like, and I, I, it's very hard for people who are not of that age to understand that like there was a time period when being a rapper was like well you be rapping oh all right that shit ain't gonna be all around right. in five years yeah yeah yeah, yeah like yeah, that yeah yeah i think i think it's full circle now when i was a kid actually it was some fly shit and now it's like oh yeah you rap yeah my cousin raps uh, so everybody it's, rap now. yeah so is my baby mama's brother y- 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 y'all should make a track together you know what i'm saying like so it's now it's a full circle it's not impressive Anymore, especially because it's like a lot less skill involved to actually do it. AI gonna make it even less impressive. Oh shit, man! I don't want to think about that. That gives me a headache just thinking about it. I mean, I ain't tri- I, ain't, I ain't tripping off AI rappers, man. Like, like I can't let that. That I won't allow that to be my competition, even in my nah, mind. Nah, no way. Like, yeah, hell no. Nah. I mean, real I, real sucker MCs, mechanical yeah, sucker MCs. Right, right. <laughs> AI write your whole verse for you and shit. So, but y'all did get to record with with Sir Jinx and go down to LA as teenagers and make demos. As early teens, like 12. That's crazy. What was that experience like? I I mean, I could could speak to one part of it. Like, for me, it put together, because I was already a DJ and we were already aspiring rappers at that point. But we was fucking with casual SP- SK1s and beatboxing in the boomboxes and shit with no real, no real equipment and no idea how things were made. And this is like, you got to re- remember the time. This is like 80s, you know what I'm saying? This is like, what, 86, 87? 87 is when we, had, when I, the first trip to Jinx was 87, I think. 87 or 88, I remember. Yeah, that. and um, so... Going to see, so Jinx invited us down for, Dale was already down there recording shit and he would come back and play a shit. And we'd be like, damn, you got your own songs? Like we're beatboxing into the boombox and playing back, you know, like real low qualities of shit, you know, just trying to be rappers. And, and Dale came back with fucking songs. Like you could play them and they sounded good. And we're like, oh shit, how'd you do that? And he was like, explain the whole Jinx shit. Brought, he was like, told Jinx, I got some boys that can rap. I went down there first with him and was rapping to him, and he showed motherfuckers how he made beats with the SB12 and how he recorded them on the four track. Next trip, me and Tajay, and so Dale was recording with him this whole time. Next trip, me and Tajay came, went down there. We had to ask our parents and and be like, you know, we're like little kids tra- traveling to LA to go record with Sir Jinx, who ain't even known yet. You know what I'm right. saying? And and um, but but uh, Dale's, you know, my pa- my dad had a relationship with uh, with Dale's mom just from us being. Kids that whole time, and also Tajay's had Tajay's mom had a relationship with my dad from us being friends the whole time. You know, parents had to know each other to let each other hang out with kids and shit. So we ended up going to L.A. and for me, seeing how a beat was made, understanding a looping, understanding a four track, this shit was like shattering glass moments for for me as far as like how how you even come up with songs and shit. And then from making songs there, would that set our bar from what we was going to do uh, moving forward? Mm-hmm. That was like a huge ass pivotal moment for all of us as far as like how you actually make music. Again, we're little ass kids and this is the 80s where there ain't no laptops and real studios is like 100 to 150 an hour and mm-hmm. you got, and it's... Uh, it's um, what do you call it? Gatekeep by record companies and budgets and shit. So you don't just get into a studio unless you got major bread, unless you a dope dealer, or you got a record deal. That's the only way you really got in any. Or you had a four track at home, like in the closet, like like Sir Jinx set up with the speakers and the microphone, and you know the pee popper that's made out of out of fucking leg leg uh pantyhose pantyhose and shit. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, 
from then on, we knew how to make songs. So after that, it was just like, this is learn how to make good songs, you know? And you just kind of slid this in here on some slick shit, but you said Easy e wanted to sign y'all? Well, he was interested in okay. signing us as a kid group. He was uh, like, I think he um he might have actually shot some bread on, on our travel to get down there, but we was too young to receive any of that. But, but like, we were getting, like, first of all, Sir Jinx and Dell was a group, so they was cool because they was connected to Cube and Dre. We're getting pitched as a kid group, and Eazy E is fucking with us. You know what I'm saying? But then it, it all that all stopped with when, when Cube left NWA. Ah, uh, I see. So it, everything kind of went different from there. Yeah. So y'all could have been crisscross before crisscross. Bruh, the song uh, "Once Upon a Time in the Projects" on Cube's first album that was me and Tajay's beat. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And then when while they were making Ice Cube's album, he was like, "Yo, Cube wants to use y'all beat." He called from New York. He was out in New York with Public Enemy. He called me at home. That's how much he fucked with us. I was a little kid, but he could call at home landline, and he was like, "Yo, beat gone." Once upon a time in the projects ended up coming out. Like we hadn't, we didn't hear Cube song until it, like it, the album was done. We got the little pre copy from Dell, but that was me and Tajay's beat that that Jinx made for us specifically. Damn. No bullshit. You could, like no, that's like can't make that shit up. I mean, uh, thinking about that being my head, I could definitely hear y'all rhyming on that, too. He made that for some kid rappers. Right. Wow. And Cube ended up making, like, a, a gangster classic with that shit. That's you know crazy. I mean? So, in the beginning, I mean, from what I understand, right, it's like Tajay, A+, plus, y'all two pretty much coming together as, like, a duo. And then and then was OPO the next person to kind of get introduced into your clique? Yeah, I went to I went to junior high school with Casual, and so he, Casual was like basically the best rapper in my junior high school. He kind of dethroned the 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 best rapper that was older. <laughs> you know what I mean? And Casual came through, and he was so motivated and so focused. You know what I mean? He was he was on a whole other level. I had. As to kind of speak to what they were talking about earlier, all my friends that I knew that none of them rapped. They like rap, but they didn't care about it. So I would be talking about, oh, man, you heard what Slick Rick said? And they'd be like, what's wrong with you, bro? Like, why you care so much? <laughs> you know what I mean? Who give a fuck what he said? Like, yeah, it's a good, I like the song, but you, you way into it. You being, you be acting weird. So Kaz was kind of like the first person that I ever met that actually got what I was even going through as a, as a, just a super fan of hip hop. So we instantaneously clicked. But he was far more advanced than me. And he just kind of helped to kind of bring me along and encourage me. Because I would say, I kicked a few raps to him. He's like, okay, that's dope. You know what I mean? Keep going. And he just kind of, he helped to kind of school me early on and motivate me to, to, to really push myself. Because before that, I was just doing it all on an island. I didn't have anybody that I could bounce ideas off of or even talk to about who I thought was the best rapper or any of that stuff. So, one, and Casual and A-plus and Taj, they, they had all, and with Dale too. I think y'all all went to elementary school together. So they was already linked up. So it was just kind of like the hand of God just came in and brought us together. So he introduced me to Taj and A-plus, and then A-plus looped me in to the crew. So... You know, God bless casual. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> and so, and Festo, you were the last one to to come into the fold. Yeah, um, it's a long story, but Tajay's, me and Tajay went to junior high together. Dell lived down the street from me, so I knew both of them, even though we didn't really rock with each other. You know what I'm saying? So around high school, I was messing with me and Tajay's god brother. We we were just like super, you know, got tight. And um, I remember one time, I think it was like all of us kicking it, and we went and swooped up A+. Plus. And I, every time he swooped A+, plus, he always had music with him. Yeah. So he would always be like, can I play this? You know what I mean? And then one time he started playing, I ain't going to say the name of the group, but the group before we, the social mission had a, different, <laughs> <laughs> had a different name. And he started playing that. And I was just like, oh, shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, Rock with it, you know what I'm saying? But I had been, I was I was a hip-hop dude. I was writing rap, so we start, we just figured out we had this common ground and, and 
you know, that's that's the short version of it. Right, but right, the rest right. is kind of history from that. But yeah, around around high school, we all, you know, we, that's when the intersection of of our friendship really just like you really got super tight at that point. Yeah, sounds like, like really fast. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it seemed, like it's it's still a blur right now when I look back on it. Like, yeah. If you think about it, I don't that. even know why they was fucking with me. My, my shit. <laughs> nah, nah, he was wrong. He was wrong. Though. My shit was lightweight. <laughs> he was wrong. You know? I, had, I, had to, I had to make a quantum leap. <laughs> Go fast, though. Go fast, though. <laughs> now, when you think about to what he said, when you think about that time, and this could count for anybody who remembers that time, um, a lot was happening mad fast. I don't know if it's that age. Mixed with that time, because it could just be an age thing. And when you're that, when you're at that age, it's a lot of development and a lot of things happening. But also, like I think, beyond just the age we were at, the way hip hop was growing at that specific time, it was still young and burgeoning and, and figuring out what it was and and growing in all kind of different uh, directions. Also, the uh, the record business was still figuring out what to do with it. Like uh, right around say to all of this Ice Cube uh, NWA shit, like, you know, from 88 plus, um, the record companies was like, oh shit, this is like the biggest selling hip hop ever. Like, the, 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 when you um, when you put like real extreme, more hardcore violence into the shit, mm. um, the record companies was like, oh shit, like, these are sales, how do we get in on this shit? You know what I'm saying? And um, it, it was just a trippy ass time for us to all to get together and just be on the kind of hip hop we was on, like like they said earlier, the one one thing about Dell and fucking with that that whole way of making music is in, being an individual and not being like any of the other artists around was a big ass deal. Exactly. It was like in, in in hip hop at that time, it was literally if you sounded like anybody else, nobody would fuck with you at all. No one would even consider listening to you. Um, if people found out that that about you would kind of sour your name in the industry, in the streets, whatever. So um, we were products of that at that time. And it was just uh, it was just kind of perfect how we all linked up because we were we're from that school of shit. Right. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And had just ha happened to be from East Oakland. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right, right. Yeah, the the no the no biting rule has pretty much gone out the window I mean, these days. It is what it is. <laughs> I think it. That's being pushed by the the labels and the major label system, though. I th really think that the the people who are in A and R, and this has been for a while, are are vultures to a large extent. I mean, it, for a while it was maybe people from the culture who were translating to the corporate, but at, at a certain point that changed, and they're just like, "Oh, that's hot! Find me one of those." And then that you know, after a while, after decades of that, biting is the whole. Thing. I mean, you know, it's fire, whatever. You look at Drake. Drake is a fantastic artist. It's not an original thing about Drake. Nothing about him is original. But he will take your whatever is hot, way way is hot, and make the best song ever out of it. So I'm not I'm not trying to take away from his talent, but it, like nothing is a, a original about him. And it, it is not to dump on Drake. I'm I can't take away from his talent. He's one. He's a lifetime huge artist. But what I'm saying is that's kind of like how how the industry goes now. Like oh they, that's hot. Mm -hmm. I can do that. You know, not that's hot. I want to do the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. And we, I mean, we used to get beat up if you bit. Right. Like, I used to get beat up, like, right, right. or or you were silenced physically if you were a biter. And I, I, that, I really don't want to sound like an old ass rapper talking about Drake. Drake is hella talented. You feel what I'm saying, though? And he is a product of his time, right? I'm just saying that in the original concept of how this was formulated, you couldn't sound like anybody else. I mean, and now when we look in hindsight, people did kind of sound alike. But during the time, they were vastly different. You know, I was talking to a youngster the other day, and I asked him, you know, you know, we love Run DMC. We grew up on Run DMC, right? And he was like, they're cool. I mean, he's 20, right? So he was like, they're cool, but they kind of sound like Soul Sonic Force. And I was like, what? And then he was playing me hard time. And he's like, and that sounds like uh, 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 Planet Rock. Right. To me, though, that back then, I'm like, Run DMC, look, no, nah, they had on, they was wearing black. They hats is different. You know what I'm saying? Now, look at DMC's glasses. Listen to his voice. But to him, you know, so it's 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 hard to see when you're in it how things can be derivative or sim similar. But but I know for a fact when we were coming up, to sound like somebody else was almost like, that was worse than being weak. Mm -hmm. You could be weak, but an original. But if you was a dope biter, you, you would never blow up. But now, I mean, you know, you listen to like AMC Rail and the House Rockers. He sound like yeah, Rock he sound Kim. like Rakim. 
But when he came out, he didn't. We couldn't. We couldn't. Yeah, I we mean, couldn't understand. Kind of. Kind of I, I, I don't know that. That what is a house rocker? But a dope <laughs> house. He, he was kind of sounding like Rock him on that. Yeah, I mean. So, trade, so, so a, I mean, I guess to say that, art even back then, labels were looking for somebody who sounded like something else. So after you have decades of that, now that's almost what it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's how. I mean, you listen to what's going on right now, and it's like eighty copies of the same song. They all jamming. They're all slapping, but. You can't tell who's who, and 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 now post uh, post streaming and post um, music purchase, the youngsters who listen they don't even know who's who. You ask them who is that, and they be like, "It's a TikTok." Mm. You know, like which one? I could find they could find you the TikTok, but they don't read who it is. They just be like this one where the dude is dancing like this. You know, and you like they don't even know the name of the artist, and that's not to fault them. That's they eat their they eat their food differently. You know, they eat with different utensils. It's just. It's 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 gotten to that point where you don't like the name of the artist and like it's not even important the style of the artist. It's, it, if it's slap, it's cool. You don't know where anybody is from, all that, and that's fine because that's just how it is right now. But we're saying back in the day to be a biter was literally like the worst. The, the, what what I mean, could you be worse than that? I mean, you really just wouldn't get any traction. There was no there was no future in it. It wasn't even like people would come at you like. Sizzling hot and be like you're a biter. You just you just wouldn't wouldn't like, oh, he's you, a biter. yeah you wouldn't get no further. You couldn't get past to the next level. And to, just to show how very we are, you know what I'm saying. I'm personally a Drake fan, and I think he is original. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying. But I, I still respect my brother, and I, and I think I get what he means. In an original sense, there's really no artist like him ever. You know what I'm saying. And, and if you look at him, but for the sake of the conversation we're having, I get what he's saying. I you know think Drake I mean? is a Drake is a fan of y'all too, and I, when oh. I when I posted my history of hieroglyphics video, he, he tapped in on that one. Wow! No disrespect yeah. to Drake, he's one of the greatest artists of our time. He is like he's a pro surfer. He can he can hop on any way right, right. and, and do it. He just don't move, he just don't create it. the motion. I got but you. now, post decades of Drake, he does create the motion. Right, like all these new artists sound. You can tell they post Drake. Like you listen to him and like, okay, that style, that's a Drake style. So I'm yeah. not, you know, he's grown into who he is. And I mean, a man's flying around on his own jumbo jet. You can't, you can't, you don't get that by being terrible. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right, Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we, we, man, we pine. Now we pine. <laughs> we pine. It's all nah, good, man. I man, mean, you know that that's this is that, that's what's dope about having so many minds concentrated yeah. on 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 one effort in the end. Like we do shit about this on everything and just talk, and then we got way more perspectives from listening to each other and all having like a you know we all looking at the same thing and can add some words and the other word person wouldn't have thought of. Like and that counts for all of us. That's what's dope about being a unit. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, we do yeah. this shit. For life. <laughs> you you got of... four unique, original individuals who make a point to be unique and original coming together to form a, a whole entity that's unique and original. And I think that's what Souls of Mischief and Hieroglyphics bring to the game. And um, I'm not going to ask you what the name was prior to Souls of Mischief. <laughs> Let the cat out the bag, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how did, how did that name come about? Because it's a pretty ill name. I mean, so, so, all right, this is the story. We were, we had gotten to a point where we were talented and, and we knew it. We were trying to do our thing and Dale was coming out with some shit. He had, you know, like, it shit was just mad, ha- was happening. And we were told that, like, man, like, your name is kind of dated. You know, what y'all rocking with? Like, it's kind of like we were told by, by, by a friend of ours, by Dante Ross, right? Dante, 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 yeah. Shout out Dante Ross. He, he, was, an, he was one of the... He's a he's a family friend of ours at this point, but at that time he was uh, he was Dell's A and R, and he was also someone that he showed was at, um, a lecture. Correct? He was at a lecture. Yeah. He was Dell's A and R that 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 Cube hooked up with to sign Dell, and he was uh, also had showed interest in Souls of Mischief at the time. We weren't Souls of Mischief yet, but at so and so at the time, <laughs> and he was like, "Man, y'all kids is dope. Y'all ever thought about changing their name though? No. You know what I'm saying?" And we were like. Ooh, damn, okay. So we were just brainstorming, brainstorming, and we would literally walk around the neighborhood or or sit and smoke weed and just do shit in our little pocket neighborhood after school and try to think of names. And just like, we literally thought of name after name after name. And then, mm-hmm. and it was, so it was like an energy effort on all our part. One day I just said, souls of mischief. And that, we was all like, that could be it. You know what I'm saying? And then it's souls of mischief stuck. But, 
I don't like to tell the story like I made up the name. I just said it on the time. It was really we were like walking around kicking rocks, walking down the street like like an old like an old school stand by me type shit. Walking down the trail talking about such and such. Nah, that one's whack. All right, such and such and such and such. Nah, too old school. Nah, and we did that shit for hours upon hours and hours. Mm -hmm. And then social and you got to remember this was like I think and. Tell me if I'm wrong. I'm almost 100% sure that Outcast came up as one of the names that we've had that came up in our process. Outcast, Little Rascals, all kind of we, stuff. Like, you know? During during this process, <laughs> we, we were sticking it. We was like, nah, not that one. So a few of the names actually ended up being... Outcasts. Yeah. Yeah, plural. we were outcasts, plural, right, 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 four of right, us. Right, right. <laughs> but yeah, so... Misfits of mischief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You remember there was like Black Sheep and Naughty by Nature we were yeah, at the time right, and leaders right. of the new school. Right, right, These right. were all Naughty acts out me. at that time. And so we were in that era talking about what's our version of how do we, you know? And then um, that that just popped up as, as easy as all the rest of them popped up, but that just one stuck. Right, and right. it was originally... But not for long. Had a Z on, on Souls. Oh, okay. Very 90s. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. then when, when, once we got the once the contract started rolling in, it, it was suggested that like maybe we should take the Z off and just put an S. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Good call. Good call. Yeah. Thank you. Right. <laughs> yeah. It might it might not have went this far, bro. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure it would have. It we would have been on the way this long with a Z in the name. 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 90, 93 to 94. Yeah. <laughs> so how how does how does Souls of Mischief get Grouped into the bigger collective of hieroglyphics, because this is becoming an entity around the same time too, right? The whole concept of like a super group. With, I mean, because it sounds like Casual's doing his own thing. Dell got a situation with Ice Cube and the Lynch Mob. You got uh, uh, Pep Love and J Biz is, is is around y'all circle too. How does that uh, come into becoming part of this one large collective? I don't even know, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, it's Dale's room. <laughs> That's what yeah, I, yeah. Okay. Dale's Dale's bedroom. Dale had a had a uh had the screen door, you know, your old school partner with the screen door that was just like always, you know, like sleeping on my couch. That's like some real shit. Like <laughs> it was brothers in there sleeping on his, you know what I'm saying? Like it was just welcome. Hello, come in. His mom was an abstract artist. She was like, you know, y'all come in and, and, and kick it. We would go up to Dale's room. And it was just we lived all around. Everybody could walk to his yeah, house. Walk. So it was like Pops was on. It ended up, Pops. Yeah. Yeah. It ended up being it be, ended up being the tr the tree house. You know what I'm saying? Was Dell thinking of like cause he's making his way through the industry? Was he just kind of thinking of a way to bring all his talented friends along with him and, and stick together? Was that kind of the the thought process behind it? Well, what happened was uh we were all going to like another little studio paying our money and getting time whenever we could to record shit. When Dell got his deal, he a part of what he got with his little come-up money was some equipment for his house. Mm -hmm. So he was like, we ain't got to do that shit no more. I got some equipment at my house now. He bought like a SB1200 and he bought like a, a EPS16 Plus and mics and all in four track. And <clears throat> he was like, "We y'all don't got to do that no more. Y'all ain't, we were spending our lunch money and shit, pooling our lunch money to go pay, pay at these four track studios and shit. Shout out to Onion Lab. Once Dale got it, got some of his come up money, some of his label money, <clears throat> and literally had Q buy him equipment and shit. Um, the sixteen, the uh, sixteen plus, we actually bought in L.A. Like walked into the store and bought it. Um, but I, I'm, I was just there. I didn't buy it. But like, so from that point on, we just Dale's was Dale's place house was the place where you can get music done. Where and he invited and he was like, it's cool for anybody trying to do this shit. All of y'all, the whole clique. Y'all can all be here doing music, and and we were. And his mom was accommodating in that note. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, she was. She was. She was. I mean, shout out Dell's mom, Stella. She was really like, imagine hieroglyphics. The whole crew being at your house all the time, spending the night eating grits and biscuits, and you know what I'm saying though, and making music. So it's not quiet, man. Mm -hmm. So a parent in the '80s and '90s who who is willing to allow that. You know, I mean, she helped save our lives. Like, like, uh, I, we really don't be talking about like how, like, we are from deep East Oakland. We're from where they find the bodies. You know what I'm saying? Though, like, they we found live. The body. They found <laughs> they found a body across the street from Ope's house, <coughs> and that per it turned out that that person whose body it was, <coughs> me and Dell had been in his house before because 
<laughs> it was a uh, a cousin to Dale's DJ at the time, and this DJ went to school in Union City, and the DJ's uncle or cousin was a dope dealer, but he was trying to invest his money in the rappers, and he was interested in signing Dale. We went to his house in in Oakland off Bancroft. He was a D, he was a dope dealer. He had stacks of money. We was kids. He had stacks of money, stacks of coke, and it was it was just wild. A few la- years later, that person was rolled up in a rug directly across the street from Op- Opio's house, mm. and this was like years later. So like, so like may, everybody may not have knew that that was dead. I was like, yo, the dude that was dead across from Op's house, that dude tried to sign Dale. We was in his house. It was the first time I ever seen a kilo was at that dude's house. It was so that's just kind of. Just where we was at. You didn't have to yeah. be involved in drugs at sure. all. Yeah. We, I mean, and that's the thing that's never really told about the, about like living yeah, in, in the hood and shit. There's everybody also there that lives yeah, there yeah. or lives around in, in these these situations other than anybody that's actually grinding out there or anybody that's a dope fiend out there or anybody involved in street shit. There's a larger percentage of everybody else. No, everybody people. else in who live in these neighborhoods is a bigger percentage of people than the people that... that, that uh, that hoods is known for stereotypically. It's wild that that's like a regular way that people think that to the point to where there's stereotypes that everybody who's from the hood is like that. You be in the middle of America where they ain't never met a black person and that's what they'll think. It's fucking crazy. But that like, it's she- great how small world that shit is. Like the dude who got wrapped up and rolled in front of Oak's house wanted to sign Dale at one point. Yeah, that's wild. And, 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 and his little cousin was Dale's DJ. Mm. And I'm, and I'm just saying, like, so she helped save our lives. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, like, that's yeah. not that's not like a small thing. She really helped save all of our lives. She saw you know, it was we, a positive thing for you to be involved in and the safe space for you to had, be and had space for it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and, and that, and that, I mean, I really don't think that we like we hear about hip hop being a negative influence and uh, hip hop is destroying the culture. And what's worse is we hear hip hoppers talking about hip hop is, the, and I'm like, man, if it was no hip hop, America would have been burnt down. Mm. We, I would have been burnt this motherfucker down. You feel what I'm saying? Though, just me, like let alone whoever else. You know what I'm saying? Though, like we we were kids who had the good fortune of having a homie whose family. I mean, also, I mean, uh, Ope, Ope, Step Pops, Michael. You know, he managed Richard, Richard Pryor and um, Taj Mahal and all this. So he, you know, this is a prominent music lawyer. So us having <coughs> parents and having parents who understood that cultivating this was was better than whatever else was out there, and parents who will beat your ass so you were more scared of them than the niggas on the street because at least I could swing back at, at somebody trying to call me a mark. You know what I'm saying? No, I can't swing back at my mom. Mm-hmm. So, so I'll definitely fight you because I have a fighting chance. I, I'm just going to get my ass. So, you know, I'm going to get home by curfew because if not, we gonna have, I'm going to have bigger problems than you thinking I'm a sucker. You know what I'm saying? No? So I just want to shout out, you know, Dale's mom. Dale even like, they really saved our lives, and I, and I'm I, that's not a small thing. That's a huge thing. Like that's the biggest thing, right? It, I mean, it, it it really made that kind of difference for us to be here now, forty plus years later, talking about it. Yeah, it it it, it it's it's one of those things. It was a time, and I'll shut up after this. It was a time when. You had to choose. Is it going to be Cortez or is it going to be Travel Foxes? You know what I'm saying? No. Is it going to be, you know what I'm saying? No. Are you going to rock the Sperrys or are you going to, you know what I'm saying? No. Rock, rock the Chucks. You know what I'm saying? No. Like, U- Ewings or the, Pro Wings. U- Ewings or Pro Wings. You know what I'm saying? No. The Honchos. You know what I'm saying? No. Or, or the, the Lava Domes. You know what I'm saying? No. So, and we we fortunately chose the Travel Foxes. That's right. And as a result, we we are alive today. And that's a huge, that's not a small thing. So you got to thank hip hop for that too because it created a, a, um, an avenue, like we would have been all, oh, we would have been successful at anything else. I'm not saying like we're not from the worst families. We're not from we have solidly like middle class. I say right. So, so it wasn't like we didn't see the alternative. But for those who grew up in crack era Oakland in the eight, like we in the eighties, in the eighties, like we were in, we were from we were from eighty second. We I didn't my whole life didn't go past High Street until like. I started going to Chabot. Like, you didn't have to go past East Montmont. Like, everything was in the East. We didn't leave the East. Like, Frisco was like, Frisco? Somebody tell you something like, but we'll go to Fisherman's Wharf as little kids. Mm-hmm. But aside from that, it was like, we, we gonna go to Frisco. Like, Frisco? What? Are you serious? Man, we lived That's in- Frisco. <laughs> like, we ain't going to Frisco. That's hell of a We lived in a time to where, like, if you lived in a party household, 
it took it was a minute before they knew that crack was bad, and it was yeah, just and it yeah. was and it was the party drug for the time. Yeah, that was that. That's if I could cl- classify a time that I felt like was that I lived in that I that when right when the the world started changing, it was right at that time. Like that's the kind of neighborhood we lived in. It was like yeah. f- the first. Like my personally, my family, this was had just broke middle class. Mm. First time we lived in a house was in this neighborhood. It was always in apartments in Section Eight before then. Mm. So it was like, and it was a party vibe too. So in the, during the crack era, like there was a time when it wasn't demonized yet. It was just, it was like the party drug for people who was already doing lines or drinking and playing dominoes and shit. Yeah, and, like, and, and, you know and, what and I'm saying? not just crack, like free bass, free, like pre-crack. Free, free, yeah, pre-crack, right, 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 free right, right, bass right. and shit. And there, there was a period in time to where people had to really realize like, oh, this crack shit really ain't cool. No, then you start- But to like people who had jobs and shit and people who were going to work and were only partying on, the, on Saturdays and shit and going to church on Sundays... And like really, that was that. It was a weird time to be because everything got trans. The whole scape of our entire community changed from that moment forward, right? And we lived right at that time. Like literally, the parents I was, the, the people I was around was was free basing on the weekend, having cool jobs, just getting their first house, mm. and. I lived, we lived in neighborhoods with these same You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so yeah. just to put a uniqueness on the time that we grew up at, at and then like when you living on the thrust of seeing the before and after of that shit, I think that affected our generation a lot in many different ways. But us particularly, hip hop was how we navigated that. And our in our um our uh our Co-passion in hip hop is what linked us up from the, from those situations in those same environments. No, that's really, it's a that's, trip. That's good context. And then, like you see, like you're saying, where that took y'all because um, Dell, who's providing this space for y'all with his family, ends up getting signed to Electra, uh, which is through Ice Cube, essentially, right? And his and Ice Cube produced and executive produced his first album, correct? Street knowledge. Street knowledge. So did that. Um, open up the doors for Souls of Mischief? Because y'all recording demos and demos and demos. Does that open up the door for y'all to uh, get a major label situation yourselves? Yeah, I mean, I would say Dale put us on the B-side of Mr. Dabalina on a song called Burnt. That's right. That's right. So when that song came That's out... That's like the first hieroglyphics appearance yeah, on Wax, basically. Like it says, Dale featuring hieroglyphics, I mm-hmm. think. But when that song came out, um, we were in ju- juniors in high school. No, we was in, we were in high school when the actual song dropped. I don't think we were seniors though. That's what I'm saying. No, I'm we were it was seniors, like seniors. I was at the line. Okay, you was at the I line. You're right. Yeah, you're right. And I remember the Dell came out the summer before senior year. Yeah, so then that was the B side yeah. of the second. So the B side of that of that song, Mr. Dabalina is burnt, and that. Gained a little traction, you know what I mean. He gave us, he gave us our shot. We put our, you know, did our thing. Casual produced the beat. Um, it's me, Cash, A plus, and Tajay, and Dell, right on that song. Yeah. And people heard the song. You know, it was kind of getting a little bit of motion. In we're in Oakland, so there's really no record industry there. But people in New York that had labels was listening like, yo, this is fire. I feel like me and A-plus jumped on the phone with Daddy Reef one day. Yep. And he was just like, yo, that, that song is fire. And kind of like gave us our props. But we hadn't really pierced the veil yet. We were just happy to kind of be out. But that definitely put a light on us. And, you know, all the different labels and whatever who was hearing that song kind of heard something special in, in each individual person that was rapping. And then that's what brought the interest to help get casual and souls and mischief signed, ultimately. And y'all both ended up at Jive, right? Yeah. And Jive was also the home of, uh, or I'm, I think y'all may have been before. Well, actually, Two Short was already signed to Jive. Yeah, definitely. And then uh, I think maybe later, 40 would, would join as well. Spice, like, Spice One. Spice One. Spice, Spice the Coup, one. right? Was the Coup on Jive as well? No, they were on Wild Pitch. Yeah. Wild Pitch, okay, my bad. Spice, it was somebody else. I feel like there was one other Bay Area and artist. And Banks. UGK. And Banks, UGK. okay. Uh-huh. Um, who else? R. Kelly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Robert. <laughs> you know, Tribe, KRS. Tribe, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a lot of 
lot of our favorite artists was on that label. So it was Too Short, Houdini. Yeah, Houdini. DDP. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, they had a they had a pretty serious roster that... Houdini it, was off, though, by the time we got on there. Yeah. But I mean, you know, the, 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 you know when First you pick record. up your records and you look and see the label, you like, whoa! Hell yeah! You know what I mean? So that was, that was that was big for us to even have any interest yeah. at all whatsoever, let alone from from label from a label that had these amazing artists that were on there. Steady you know? B. Back Steady B. Steady B. GTFO was on there for a minute. Yeah, it's a deep roster. So they gave y'all the the budget to create ninety three two the album. Yeah, we had like a bidding war, so we were kind of like from this from the time that he's talking about it kind of escalated to where a few different labels were interested in us because uh so what happened was we put a demo out after the burnt and all of that and some labels were like let's hear more. So we gave a second demo and by that time some labels was really on us and our lawyer which is his stepdad um Michael Michael Ashburn, who he mentioned before. And that's another one of those things that was like some real lightning in a bottle type shit. Like, um, similar to Ice Cube being Dell's cousin, is his stepdad being not, um, Michael Ashburn, who's an who's a entertainment attorney. He actually happened to be Ice Cube's attorney at that time. Mm. And that's just some like completely unrelated shit that happened to be true. Now, how crazy is that? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So when we started getting interest in us... <clears throat> His stepdad was like, well, I'll guide y'all through the process to make sure y'all don't get fucked. He's married to his mom. He's looking out for us because it's his son's group. So, but he happened to be Ice Cube's attorney when Ice Cube, he's the one who, the attorney who got Ice Cube out off of Roofless. Mm. Which is the the people who wanted to sign us when we were kids. Right, so, right. it's just some weird God hand that's, shit on our whole situation. Trip. Yeah. That's that's yeah, a, that's I mean, a trip. One other part of the story too is uh is the uh the Gavin convention mm -hmm. in San Francisco. That was um <clears throat> that was a radio convention where uh you know like he was talking about the Bay. We don't really have a music industry. That was like our industry event. So radio DJs, uh label folks would come all out for the Gavin convention. And it was the height of the Gavin convention was around that time. So you're talking about 91, 92, 93. And we would go up there with intentionality, with with like with with our demos, with with like all right, let's get in these ciphers and 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 rap with other rappers because we knew other rappers from all over the country were coming there. Um, and so that's a, I feel like that's that definitely really the the fire was lit, but that definitely like fanned the flames for Souls of Mischief and Casual. Facts. I yeah. remember coming back to Casual's crib after the Gavin, and like this is back in the days of. Uh, Voice voicemails. He literally had like executives when he got back home. Like, hey, this is such and such. I want you to give me a call. I'm interested in signing you. Da 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 da. da. But we were these these bidding wars. Like they were saying, the bidding wars were beginning at that time. But it was because we were talking to people like Daddy Reef, Dante Ross was already uh, Dell's and R. Um, and then the demo at that point was was already circulating around that time. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so y'all were really in in the mix, basically establishing your reputation and 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 getting out there in the industry, in the actual industry, mm -hmm. like you're saying, beyond like trading demos with your friends. Now you're getting into the industry, and it paid off. Obviously, ended up on Jive, and all y'all make beats too, right? Um, Everybody except it, me, huh? I yeah. thought I seen your name on a couple I've, I've, credits. I've, I've, I've dabbled. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. I've dabbled. But I mean, please, you you uh, made the beat for '93 till infinity, yes. um, which I always give you a lot of props for, bro. Thank you. You made one of the greatest beats in hip hop history. Uh, I mean, I, of, all of all time, man. I mean, damn. I don't think there's anyone that would disagree with that. Um, I've heard y'all say that the moment y'all heard that beat, you knew that y'all had something. Was is that the case? Yeah, I mean, in a way, like I was, I was just treating it like a beat, like because I, I made a few different beats, and I, just, I was just treating it like a beat. But when we, when, when all the fellas heard it, they was like, "Yo," they was like, "Yo, we fucking with this sound." And then, so I thought it was dope, but I'm biased. I liked all of them. 
You know what I'm saying? I can't I can't honestly say that I personally in my head was like, this is the one. This is gonna do it. I felt that way about beats before. You know what I'm saying? I didn't I can't I didn't honestly feel that way. I thought it was dope. I thought the other ones I had were dope too, but I I thought this was dope too. Like, so when when they heard it, they were like, yo, what what the what are we what what are we doing, bro? Like, so. Yeah, I could imagine. Cause I mean, when that song drops, just the intro alone is just kind of like catches your attention. I think if you people for people who have heard the original Billy Cobham sample, like you really freaked that beat. Wow. There's a lot of like uh technical technicalities that goes into freaking that. You didn't just play a loop, four bar loop. You really, you know, the frequencies and, and the way you chopped it is is crazy. Wow. Wow, man. Thank you. I believe your first single was That's Where You Lost, right? And that how was the reception for for that? Crazy. Crazy? Yeah. So out the gate, it was crazy. Yeah, I mean yeah. that was like a club song. Like, you know, like they used to play that in the clubs. Uh, yeah. Um, we go. We'd be in New York, and we'd be like, "Yeah, we'd be in New York, and come on in the like club." A, yeah, yeah. Like, like, yeah. 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 yeah, and y'all had a video that was like on the box and stuff like that, right? <laughs> so, but ninety three two was the second sample, second or excuse me, second single. So that did that take the momentum and just like turn it up even more? We was gone, man. Gone, huh? That set it off. I got some yeah. real, real radio, daytime radio. So. Uh huh. In the video, the the video response to that was like a, a notch up from from that's when you lost. Yeah, yeah. For sure. No one has seen a video like that at that at that time. Like, where is that? Lake Berry or something. Uh, <laughs> close, <laughs> close. Yosemite, <laughs> Yosemite uh, North Beach in Frisco, um, Pinnacles yeah. National Monument. Where else? And then just riding in between all mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And High Street Oakland, Studios. San Francisco. Oh, yeah. 75th and Mac. Yeah. We literally, like, the whole, us and the, and the whole film crew rode around in, like, RVs for, like, I, what's it, like, two weeks or some shit? Sure. A week and a half? It was shorter than that. Like, it, had, it was maybe three, three days when we was in the RV. We rode... Like to Pinnacles and, and yeah, Yosemite and did all that, and then we came back and did some stuff in San Francisco and on Canada. separate day. Oh, sorry, on separate days after. Yeah, so it wasn't. We kind of like yeah, it wasn't one location. Mm-hmm. We was mobbing yeah. around. It's like Hyde Street Studios. Yeah, we we're in there, and then um, it's like a rooftop that we did right. right uh, that rooftop is on what third? I don't remember. It's right down by the uh, by AT and T Park. There's a rooftop over there. That's like the first scene. The yeah, the, scene. the video uh, fits the song and the vibe perfectly. So I could imagine that having that out helped a lot too. It's huge. Um, and, and there was no video that looked like that prior to that in hip hop. Yeah. When you think about it, like, like nobody nature was scenes. Yeah, nature scenes and then guys peeling out and, and mm-hmm. you know, staying on things. And, you know, then you look at our, our outfits and all that kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like it was it was a different... We were trying to do something different, and I think it really made a huge difference. But also, like, if you look at our outfits and all that, we were kids of that era. So we got on the polo, and we got on, you know, the, the Jack Purcells and the V-neck sweaters and Chabot, all that, you know. Chabot shirt. Chabot, Chabot, Chabot yeah, 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 you know. <laughs> Weak-ass herring bones and shit. <laughs> that was, like, the first taste of, like, uh, you know, audience-controlled TV I guess you could say, because like, because right. because of the video, they had this this show called the Video Music Box. It was all around the country, right. but when you called in, every it had a local number for every. For, so if you you could call in, and then your video would get played. So like it would, it did. There was no like cap on how many times the video got played. So if people just kept, we'd be like, call call the jukebox, call it. out here. So it would just be like the video. It come on, then it. Three videos later, come on again. Three videos later, come on basically, again. Basically like streaming. And I mean, that's what like... Yeah, right. The, the concept that 20-year-olds know all the words to our albums when they don't play us on the radio. That lets you know that when you put the control into the fans' hands, they they make their choice and they choose quality a lot of times. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, that 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 always trips me out too. Like, we, I think when streaming first came out, we were wary of it. And now I'm I'm pretty sure that's what's keeping us alive. I mean, you might hear you only hear 93 till maybe once a week on Earth. You know, everybody on Earth might hear it once a week. And maybe, okay, that's millions of people hearing it. I mean, whoever listens to terrestrial radio, right? But when you look at our streams, it's crazy. And then 
the fact that the people that are streaming it are not our age. They're youngsters, and they're streaming the whole album. They know the words to all the... They're not just playing 93 Till. You know, they're playing stuff like Step to My Girl, which is a demo song that we put on like a bootleg record. You know, that's probably, what, is that our second biggest song? Like, well, yeah. Or to one of our top three on, on, on streams, Spotify, you know? I think. So, so. 162 million on Spotify for uh, 90 million. Uh, step. Pull that up quick. Hey. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's like when you look at that, it's, 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 it's crazy, right? It's Com- crazy. Compared to the, 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 our radio or TV press, it's like we don't be on TV, we don't be on the radio. Our, our tours be sold out. It's crazy, but it's not crazy. Because if you're making like a classic hip hop playlist, a chill hip hop playlist, a lo fi hip hop playlist, and you don't have 93 till on it, it's like, well, what are you doing, bro? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, that it just, and also, I just feel like <laughs> the message of that song is so simple. Like this is how we chill. We're just chilling. You know what I'm saying? We're just chilling. We got some. We got some forties in the fridge. You know what I'm saying? We're about to call up a girl. Like we're just chilling. Like that. That's when you talk about twenty year olds. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think, I think, that's, 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 yeah. Go ahead. I think that's what the dope thing about the song, and I think you know we've phrased this before at different times. Is but um, it's like capturing the energy of that age and that time. It's captured in the song. You know what exactly. I'm saying? So. No matter how you know we're we're older and the song is older, that energy continues to happen to a group of people on Earth as time goes on. And so, if it's the kind of song that also it has that effect on you and leaves you with an effect of nostalgia, because that's a song that's kind of it has a nostalgic kind of vibe to it. So everybody who ever connects with it because of that energy now has a reason to feel uh, nostalgic about it. Yeah. It's just one of those weird songs that keeps translating from generation to generation because it it, enca- it encaptures and encapsulates the energy of a time that everybody goes through. It's a very formative time in life. Super young, super vibrant, super like, like you know what I'm saying? It's being bold without being careless because it's just your nature, your energy at that time. And you riding a wave of a bunch of young, a whole generation of people at that same age. That shit affects the earth when that many spirits are moving in the same direction. And so that just continues to happen. Like we go out um, on the tours now, and and even the uh, the analytics on on the streaming, and there's large amounts of young people. We just came from Europe, and it was like people bringing their twelve year olds, people knowing the knowing the uh, the words, eighteen year olds, twenty five year olds to thirty year olds, all being the, the majority of the crowd. When we ask about thirty and up, it'd be like 20 percent of the people. Not all even of these 10, young 20%. people, That's crazy. 10, Not even yeah. 10 to 20%. When we ask, is this your first first soul show? All the young people in the front like this, but they knowing every fucking word. Because of streaming, and for some reason, in their in their um, youthful energy, they're vibing with the energy of that song. It matches their. It's something about that song, man. It's like it just, you know, it, everybody goes through that time, and you're gonna relate to that song because of that, regardless of how old it is. Well, it, it's just weird, like that. I mean, it's, there's you know, a word for it, and uh, it, it gets applied loosely, but it's accurate in this case. And the word is timeless. It's just mm-hmm. a timeless song. So, you know, I can't give y'all enough props for, you know, and not to even just focus on that song, your whole catalog, but, you know what I'm saying? That is, that song is just, it speaks for itself, man. Thank you, Thank you brother. Thank you. Thank you. And the album as well, really dope album. I feel like between those singles we're talking about and then the album coming out, it's like, okay, these guys are on the map. And I wanted to ask y'all about something. This is crazy to me. The class of 93, I've seen y'all like kind of Use this in your branding and, and talk about it. And I, I wrote down some of the debut albums that came out, out in 1993, including yours, Wu-Tang, Wu-Tang, Enter the 36 Chambers, Snoop Dogg, Doggy Style, Onyx, Back the Fuck Up, Black Moon, Enter the Stage, Freestyle Fellowship, Alcoholics, Fat Joe, Lords of the Underground, Mob Deep, Akinelli, the Beat Nuts, and then back in the Bay in Northern California, Sibo, Gas Chamber, Total Devastation, Dre Dog, E40 Federal, first solo album, Be Legit, first solo album, Ant Banks, first solo album, Mac Mall, The Coup, Conscious Daughters, San Quinn, and Drew Motherfucking Down. What the fuck was going on in 1993, man? That is like... 
It That's was, the that was, was the year to drop, man. Yeah, it was different. It was what the fuck? It was, different, was there like a shift in? in Cause I, when I think about an album like uh, Doggy Style or Wu Tang, it's like a huge shift compared to what was going on before. Or I mean, what, what was y'all perspective on that? Let me say this: It's really 1992. Okay, I'm gonna tell y'all why. Because back then, it took albums almost a year to come out after they were made. It did, it's not like now where you can just make your album, okay, send it to, to mix, send it to master, and it's coming out in two weeks after we go through. It wasn't like that back then. It was like it took longer to record it. Well, to make to, to make to the actually product, make it, it took longer to record it. To, yeah, to manufacture. Then then you had to go through the red tape of like we didn't have Photoshop. We didn't have none of that stuff. So you talking about exacto blades and uh, and real for film photography, waiting for the film to come back, all kind of stuff. So all of that stuff really happened in '92, and then it dropped in '93. Mm. So props to 1992. You know what I'm saying? And that happens to be our graduation year too. So I'm a little more partial to 1992. <laughs> <laughs> so we really are class of '92. But nah, that that year is incredible, man. All the music that came out. And then I feel like for the next like at least two years that the ball was was still oh, yeah. rolling. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. At least until '96 for sure. Yeah. And then those were just the debut albums. I didn't even name like the the sophomore follow up yeah, albums. That's crazy. Yeah, because uh, KRS One, uh, that's one you didn't mention. That came out the same day as your album. Yeah. Because yeah. yep. those two. So Jive was like, we're gonna release y'all the same day as as KRS One, which is like the ultimate respect to us. Right. Right. And then how does it feel to like? Uh, I saw this article come out, I think it was a couple of years ago, where Andre 3000 was talking about how him and Eminem used to just go back and forth on the phone reciting y'all lyrics. How did, I mean, how did y'all, and if you, if you think about their styles and your styles, it kind of makes sense in retrospect. I mean, how does that make y'all feel, man? I say it's, it's a huge compliment because, you know, they got a lot of success. And they don't even have to talk about that. You know what I mean? They they choose to highlight our contribution and our influence on them. And we fans of them. We I mean, we fans first. We always say that. We love hip-hop music in general. We've been fans from day one, and we still remain fans to this day. So it's... I think the, one of the main reasons of what motivated us in the beginning was to kind of earn the respect of our peers, we saw these great MCs out there. We knew it was other cats in the wings. You know what I mean? Like you mentioned Freestyle Fellowship, the Alcoholics, Farside Brothers like that that was doing their thing. We we wanted to earn their respect as well. And even in the OGs also. So when you see someone that's that accomplished, you know, Andre 3000, Eminem, they get mentioned in the top five. You know? So for them to to actually speak on us like that, it's the the respect is mutual, but it it mean a lot coming from them for sure, and it's it's an honor to have them highlight us like that. Feel it definitely feels good. I mean, Eminem shouted us out when he was doing that long thing when he just right. shouted out all those yeah. rappers. I mean, that was crazy. That all was the fame acceptance speech. Yeah, I mean, yeah. just the way that he did that because he shouted out so many people, mm -hmm. and you know what I mean. That that just shows you know that's in the same way that we talk about we humble or whatever. Like that's that's love and respect. Yeah, and I think that, you know, it just it speaks to that. Like I said, when you talk about the class of 93, y'all are part of these emerging voices in hip-hop at the time. It's not just this one song. It's it's not just this one album. It's it's y'all coming into the game at this time, putting it down for yourselves and the rest of the crew with hieroglyphics. And then what I said earlier in the beginning about, like, y'all get in some spaces where a lot of big cast aren't able to get into for whatever reason. So, like, when I and I, when I think about like the East Coast having respect, uh, um, the, sometimes some people feel like the respect for the Bay Area isn't there from the East Coast, but y'all got it. Like I heard like the OG like stretching Bobito freestyles that y'all did, and then also like another thing that I think is hella dope is that on the Tribe Called Quest album Midnight Marauders, there's pictures of all the hip hop greats in the background of the cover and, and y'all are on there. How, how did that feel and, and how did you establish the, the relationship with, with Tribe? Because y'all have worked with, uh, um, with, with all of them and toured and 
Ali Shaheed Muhammad has appeared on your albums. How did that relationship come together? I think it started with Dale and Q-Tip because Dale and Q-Tip were were like friends. Like they, I remember we had Low End Theory, like the demo version of Low End Theory before it actually dropped and all that. But then we were label mates too. So um, like Q-Tip picked our second, uh, our third single, which is Never No More. Right, right. Um, and was also, you know, Chris Lighty, rest in peace, Chris Lighty. They were all instrumental in like getting us out on the road and, um, you know, that first tour that we ever did was with them and I was, that was because of Tribe. For the most part, Daylight too, but Tribe was our label mates. Mm -hmm. So that's how that relationship forged. I mean, we, we, see, we saw them every day for like, I remember it as like 50 dates, but I don't know, maybe, maybe a little more, a little less. But yeah, just on some big brother stuff. Q, I remember Q-Tip coming to our, uh, our um, album release party in New York. And um, just like, you know, having sort of like a pep talk with us, like, it's time now kind of thing. You know what I'm saying? So that, that's, it's always been, we, we always, we were fans of them, still are. Um, one of the greatest groups ever, in my opinion. De La too. Rest in peace to Dave. Uh, True Goy, you know, I mean, they just, you know, rest in peace to Fife. I mean, they just... Um, it was a blessing, man, just to just to be around them dudes, just to get that energy and just to like learn the ropes from them as far as touring and and listening to the records, learning from them that way too. Yeah, I could imagine. And then, I mean, stylistically, there's kind of a vibe there where y'all vibe kind of goes hand in hand. Uh, um, and also, like you kind of said earlier, like being from the hood but not going in certain negative directions, but still being able to relate to that to that lifestyle and that audience. So I feel like that's dope, that that connection between the tribe and, and, and uh, Souls and Hyro. But now I got to take it back to the Bay, and I got to ask you about some crazy shit, man. The Hieroglyphics Hobo Junction battle. So it was sparked off by Saphir and Casual. Hip-hop history on the Wake Up Show. Hey, I ain't gonna lie, bro. He said Buffy and Brad, bro. He kind of... Damn, he said, oh, your dad is my lawyer. <laughs> he was going... Sophia was going off on y'all, bro. But how did that... How did that come together? And, and, I mean, what's your recollection of that, bro? I think, basically, Casual put Sophia on his album. Damn near got him signed, right? You know, right. they put him on a national scale. And Saphir, Casual was supposed to be do the same thing for Saphir's album and sort of blew it off, right? So, you know, studio time used to cost money. So, you you know, he, you, you wasted his money, wasting his time, et cetera. But Casual, wasn't, it wasn't malicious. It was just kind of like, oh, I'll get to it, blah, 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 you know? And it, so I think that's, that, I think, started the bad blood between Casual and Saphir. We didn't know there was any bad blood. We seeing this nigga every day. You know what I'm saying? No, we, no problems, no issues, you know? And then all of a sudden, I guess they went up on the radio and started di dissing fools. I believe it was on stage first. No, it was, out, it was at the wake up show. It was at the wake and up show. It was on the wake up show. Yeah, yeah, I'm sitting here. Yeah, 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 Mike yeah, yeah. T was at the show. Casual had a show. Yeah, Mike yeah, T was yeah. like, this fool is on the radio dissing you. You know what I'm saying, yeah, though? Yeah. I remember I rolled up to the radio. Like, let's do it. Literally, three words. Let's do it. Oh, my beef ain't with y'all. It's with casual. Like, nigga, what? Like, that's our pop. You know what I'm saying, though? Like, your beef is with us if it's with Casual. But mm -hmm. okay, let's go to this, go to the show. Then we roll over to the show. They battle or whatever. Safira had written reps already. But so, you know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying about malice. Like, and then shout out Safira, man. It's all love. Man. Right. So he had, but ammo he had for, already for, already had written shit for about, all y'all. But no, for casual. For casual, okay. Right? And then they battle there. He said some of the raps that he said the next week or whatever on the wake-up show there that night. And so was you, at the, uh, at the, the, at the crash, but what was it? Kennel Club. Kennel Club, yeah. Mm -hmm. What is that now? It's the Independent now. Independent now. Yeah. Kennel yeah. Club, then it was the Crash Palace, right. then the Independent on the visit there or whatever. So he goes, they bust, inconclusive, you know, it's, 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 it's rap, you know, whatever. But it ain't like funk, you know what I'm saying? No, this is our partner. This is our partner. So we like, oh, we didn't even know you had beef like that, you know what I'm saying? So... He's like, well, let's do it next week at the wake-up show. Yada, 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 yada. Okay, cool. Whatever, we're going to go rap. So we set up a, a, a battle. He sets up a battle at the wake-up show. Now, the whole week, we got mutual friends. They telling us what he's going to say, this, that, and the third. And we like, he writing raps. Like, we don't, we freestylers. Like, we don't even get down like that. Like, I'm not writing a rap about no rapper. 
Like, you know what I'm saying? Oh, that's pause worthy. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, I don't, I don't care about that. So he goes up to the wake up. We go to the wake up show. Man, this fool got cameramen. You know, like he wants to take a picture posing like George Foreman and you know what I'm saying? Oh, like it was it was a big hullabaloo about it. And he was seeing this sort of this watershed moment or like this pivotal career thing. You know what I'm saying though? So and then we in there, kind of, you know, and then also we show up there and it's all the little side rappers who are our mutual friends. Like, oh, we back in Safiro. You know what I'm saying? I was like, oh, we didn't even know you felt like this about niggas. And, and, and honestly, at that time in our life, hella arrogant, you know, young, the best rappers on earth. You feel what I'm saying, though? So, so not not really worried about no rap. Like we have, we coming off of tours and stuff, just slaying fools every day because nobody nobody could freestyle. Everybody. So, but when you're battling somebody who just got a written rap that they ain't written about you, and you busting a freestyle about them, you are gonna decimate them, right? I mean, so, and this is prior to this is when freestyling to us was busting off the top. Mm-hmm. So we go up there, we battle, we rap. It's fear kicking, written, it's casual, and us we kicking freestyles. It's apples and oranges, all, you know what I'm saying? No, but now that being said, that, that thing got off. You know what I'm saying? No, he came to the to the to the to the boxing match with a pistol. So you can't knock what he did because there aren't no rules in this. I mean, but he, I mean, he'll say it. He'd be like with the writtens, with the writtens, like before he busts his rap. So it's not something where he was trying to hide that he wrote the raps. It's just the Saphir style is so unorthodox. Niggas be thinking like they thought the song on Casual shit was a freestyle. He say on the, at the beginning of the song, oh, this is my third time doing this shit. It was the same rap. He kicked it different each time because his style is on He got a, a drunken master kind of style. You know what I'm saying, though? So it's like apples and oranges, but I feel like the concept that we got up there, we got down, it helped the wake-up show, it helped Saphir, it helped Hieroglyphics, and and and, and that's, that's all, that's, in hindsight, a great example of Bay Love. Now, at the time, it was funk. Like, it was real funk. You know, like, post that battle, it was problems. You know what I'm saying? But even that, at a certain point, cooler heads prevailed, and we was all like, man, we ain't even, it ain't even like that. You know what I'm saying, though? But but it, it was it was funky for a second, you know? Yeah, but, I can't but imagine. You can't take away nothing. Like, I think sometimes cats will be like, well, he was he was kicking written, he was kicking freestyles. That's unfair. It ain't, it's all fair in battle. If you look at um now the whole battle league and all that, That's you got serious. dudes that... For really, you got to stay mixy with it, right? right? So you have you you they sit and study a dude for, you know, write about his baby mama and his his third grade crush he had on and all this kind of stuff. But they'll also throw some the dudes that are really raw. You know, I don't even know no names really, but some of them will throw some free. You could tell they throwing some freestyles in there, but they can mix it up in a way that makes them prevail. So, I mean, you know, shout out Sophia, shout out Casual, shout out Sway for really putting that on the radio. Also, I would say like. How do you battle on the radio trying not to curse yeah, too? Yeah. Freestyle. Mm-hmm. So it was it was some strictures and, and stuff ar- around that. But that being said, I think it was overall dope. And like you can't you can't knock anybody who participated in that, really. You know what I'm saying? No, no? Not but at it all. was this is our partner. Yeah. This is the big homie too, right? This is our partner. We didn't did all kinds of skits. You know what I'm saying? Like, so it's really, it was a uh, uh, mind-boggling that you got this kind of animosity towards niggas when we was just partners like three weeks before that. You know what I'm saying? They're like partners, like I'm at your house type thing, you know? And that, and I think that was added to the anger and the bad blood at the time. Cause, I mean, because you don't even know niggas feel like that about you. Then you showing up and it's all these little side men that also have this kind of animosity. And I'm like, nigga, I haven't given two brain cells a thought about your life ever, ever. You know what I'm saying? No. And now you, oh, you got beef with us? Even the, uh, you know, but... In in hindsight, it's, it's, it's been good, right? It is a monumental thing for the Bay. You know, when family feuds, nobody wins or whatever, but it, it showed who is family, who isn't family, and that, that kind of helped us tighten up too. You know what I'm saying, though? Like, okay, well, we can't just be having everybody around us because niggas look at you like food. You know what I'm saying, though? But in the end, like, I mean, am I, am I, being, am I mischaracterizing it? It was sort of freestyle verse written, and it was just like, you know, like, and then, I mean, it was, some, you know, it was more shit like, you know, we from the East, they not, you know what yeah. I'm saying? No, all that kind of stuff, too. So there was more to it than just some rap beef. And, but that's, that's, you know, like, but I, like, it was dope. I, like, I listen to that battle that's every now and then. It's shit fine. It's that's funny, though. Dope. It's funny. But I, I really want to make it clear, like, we was freestyling. He was kicking rittens. You know what I'm saying? Right, you know? right. But and people are always like, oh, because his style is unorthodox. 
they're like, oh, he was kicking that off the dome. I'm like, nah, that wasn't. And he and he and he will he'll never even say that was, you know. Yeah, I mean that's it's a documentary out right now. Yeah, on that too. Yeah, you yeah. seen it? Yeah, yeah. But, but, uh, directed by a uh, great uh, visionary, Shamari Smith. Yeah, who also directed uh, the the Souls of Mischief till infinity, twenty year journey of Souls of Mischief. So. It's called the battle. Go go check that out if you haven't. That's seen. right. That's right. Yeah, that's what I was peeping. That's why I heard. I heard it was you. You said my pops is your lawyer. You you, you got off on the on the freestyle on them. Speaking facts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that's, no, uh, seriously though. Um, you know, shout out to Sphere because, you know, he wanted he wanted the Bay Area legends that a lot of people mention, uh, you know, all the time, and he had that he had that style. You know what I mean? He had that that drunken style. Yeah. I can I can hear people that even now, you know what I mean? I can hear his influence still shining in MCs, you know that they take little pieces from what he put out there. You know what I mean? So he was he was definitely a a, a worthy opponent. You know what I mean? We talking about sh- close to 30 years or something since that battle happened. It's been a long time. People still talking about it. So Yeah, no doubt. No Salute. Doubt. I don't think there's any other live spontaneous battle that's ever been captured like that, um, and it's, uh, I don't think anybody lost. I think it's a big win for for the culture. So, supposedly, too, on top of that, like th- those were the uh, biggest ratings for the Wake Up Show, like Good ever uh, ever to that point. The ratings were so high, and then right after that is when they, you know they moved to LA and syndicated. So it was like it was like big for. Hip hop radio, and you know how big that went. You know, Sway and the Wake Up Show. Shout out Sway. That's that's Shout that's big, Sway. bro. Shout he's a, Sway. Yes, he sir. he's been doing. He's like top of the food chain in that shit. And that night is directly linked. Not saying cause it, but directly linked to to uh, his star. You know what I'm saying? Well, how I, much a star he's I think become. That also speaks to his skill and creativity as a curator and a radio host yeah. to even allow something like that and know how to. Mediated and moderated. I would go even further than allow. I think he was the one that came up yeah, with the idea okay. for the battle. Okay. Like he was like, "Why don't y'all come up to this uh-huh. radio station and, and do this, you know, on the radio station?" So yeah, I mean, he he was the architect of that for real. That's what's up. Because a little a little known thing that's linked to all of this that Sway will admit to as well too is like, so hieroglyphics was we used to come to the station a lot because at that time we was buzzing. Like Dell was out, we were we were buzzing in the, in the um. In the Bay Area hip hop world, and and we had a relationship with Sway, and we, you know, he did the Wake Up Show. That's where the hip hop was being represented, the, and, and we were right in that lane. And we used to come up there, and we kind of, we not kind of, we coined the um the whole when you have to you have to freestyle when you come up here. It was because mm-hmm. we were coming up there and freestyling, and then it became a regular thing from literally from us coming up there freestyling. Like I hope your stepdad, sorry, to cut you off. Hope yeah. your stepdad was his was. Sway's lawyer too. So oh, we, so okay. we knew Sway like for years prior to that. Well, he, yeah, yeah, he was rapping in Oakland. Yeah, he, and he, and he was rapping and, and getting into the music business, getting into the radio business right at that time. He was already a rapper with songs out, right? And he was being represented by Opio's dad. That's dope. So we knew about him. Then we used to see him in the office. Like I used to, we used to see him when he came into the, to, you know, o- Ops. Uh, Pops had the, the law offices uh, upstairs, so we used to see Sway come in, and he—that's how he first got familiar with us. Like all oh, these young dudes getting it in, whatever. And then he would see us later, like all oh, the kids at, at Michael's house, you know. Right. right so by right. this time, we had a relationship with him. So, and we were we were like getting it in in, in the hip hop scene, like for at, at that time, we were like out there, like with hieroglyphics, like fuck with him. We was we was serving fools all over the Bay Area. You, know, wake up, you went on the wake up show first, like without everybody, right? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. 91. Yeah, yeah. So, like yeah. 91. He went on. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. That's what's up. Shout out Sway, man. He really helped put us on for real. For real. Like shout, shout out Tech and Sway. Mm-hmm. Just for being innovators and, and lasting through all these different eras, but really putting us on for real. I mean, we still go like we still go to Sirius XM and and yeah. do our thing to this day, whenever we gotta drop a record, and he's always receptive. Like so he's not one of them dudes that switched up, even though he's in one of the more powerful positions in the industry, you know? Yeah, no, no doubt. He's He's been tapping in and supportive of what I've been doing, too, and that's, I appreciate that a lot. Um, and he, he also uses his platform to spotlight a lot of Bay Area talent, so that's dope. Um, your second album, No Man's Land, that was your last album released on Jive? 
I feel like the album's kind of slept on. It slaps. I was bumping it the other day. I think No Man's Land. Personally, I like No Man's Land. I don't like the album more than the other one, but I think it aged better. In this way, No Man's Land sounds like a current rap album. 93 Till sounds like a period piece. Sure. But when you talk about the bass lines, the, 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 yeah. the, the rap styles and all that kind of stuff, like... Go pick that record up and don't listen to it as an old record. Listen to it as a new, like our new record. And I think you would be pleasant, pleasantly surprised. That being said, our fans was not. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and, and what's the trip is like, you know, it's kind of revisionist history too because the album didn't sell bad at all. Oh, yeah, okay. The album sold well. It's just that... Um, it's it's really a trip. Well, we busted a hard left on the um on the record company because basically, long story short, um after the success of the first album, they immediately came at us and was like, We want y'all to be a pop group now, like a pop rap group now. Like literally, it's as crazy as it sounds. We just put out 93 Till, that album. They know our get down, they're happy with the album, all of that. And they're like, we're changing the structure of the record, of the, our record company. And now we want to, we're going to keep like R. Kelly and Too Short. But now we're doing like NSYNC and shit and, and, and Britney yeah, Spears right, type shit. Right. And we're changing the paradigm of our record label. And we want y'all to be like, like a shiny, shiny suit version Jazzy Jeff Fresh Prince. Like boom, shake the room type shit. They literally use that as an example of, they, they brought us into the, the room. The, nego- the, the record label meeting room and we getting there like what we gonna talk about this album's dope da 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 we about to do the next one I know y'all happy and then they hit us with that so we were like nah we don't that ain't what the kind of music we make y'all know that blah 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 and they got to the point to where they were like well if you don't do that we're not gonna support any of your releases we're gonna shelve you that's pretty much gonna kill your career and all of that and we were like Fuck that. And so we made No Man's Land. Mm. So that's kind of the back, the behind story on the um, the vibe change of, from the vibe change, besides our growth in age and experience, the vibe change from 93 till infinity to No Man's Land. It was directly affected by that. We, we had a different demeanor and attitude towards record labels and towards like just shit. That was mixed into the creation of that album. Yeah, so y'all was trying to make like an anti-pop record almost it, it was definitely the furthest away from anything that they were requesting we were basically like do what you will you got our life in y'all and you got our career in your in your hands but we not gonna do what y'all saying yeah we can't I mean, even we, we can't even, we couldn't live with ourselves we even went a little into like you know what i mean we kind of we didn't acquiesce but we we kind of like said okay all right they gave us like one thing i remember about it to piggyback on what he's saying is they wanted they didn't want us to produce the record you know, even he, even after ninety three, even after he had produced ninety three till and all, and they were like, we have these other producers for y'all. Who I remember one of the producers was Battle Cat. They had they had Battle Cat. They had a, they had a couple other people whose whose names I can't remember right now. But we actually did we we didn't do a song with Battle Cat, but we did a song with some other some at least one other producer I know. Oh, the the dude from Sack. Right, songs. right. They got Michael right. Ashburn hooked that up. Yeah, that right. was someone, yeah. Oh right. boy, oh, I'm glad them songs. But snuck. we were just, you know, we were a self-contained <laughs> oh, unit at that music. time. We weren't rocking with other producers at all. You know what I mean? Nobody had. I mean, Dell rocked with, with with the Boogeyman on his first record, but you know, obviously, everything after that is produced is high row produced, right? So we weren't trying to even venture in that direction at all. I, yeah, I mean, just uh, during this conversation, like I think that speaks to what y'all, how y'all started. In the early days, what you saying about Dell pushing you to be original, to have your own shit, like developing that style together in the group, it's like you know, Battle Cat, Battle Cat is dope, but you can't, that's not really your sound. I mean, I think everybody crap. felt like that we had gotten better. You know what I mean? Like that's it was all about like pushing the envelope and and trying to remain on the cutting edge. And so if you feel like, like you got to remember, a lot of the 93 Till stuff was demoed, so it was made in like 90 and 91. Mm. So back then, when you're like 16, 17 years old, by the time you're 19 and 20, you're like, what? I'm better than I was when I was 16 and 17 years old. I've, I've made it. I've, that was like four eras went by at that time. You know what I mean? Like in, in just in music in general, so especially in hip hop. Yeah. So by that time, it was like, we got some other shit that we wanted that we want to rock with, you know what I'm saying? And they just were like, Taxi might have been a been a been a thorn in their side because they they kept wanting to push Taxi out. See, on the first record, they couldn't do it because Bob James wouldn't clear the sample. Bob James, who made the original composition, and then on the second record, so they like okay, but we made 93 Till, so they were like okay, cool. 
on the next on a, on No Man's Land, they wanted us to do it again, and they were like, "We cleared the sample," but they found out that they actually didn't clear the sample because Bob James, even though he had the original composition, he didn't even own all of the sample because it was produced for the for uh, what's the, the uh, shows, yeah. for, for the Taxi, studio? Right. It was yeah. Paramount, Paramount Studios, yeah. yeah. So I felt like that was about that was that's one reason too why they were like, okay, well. All right, let's, this is a throwout, basically. So y'all basically just got caught in the industry fuckery. Yeah. And so did they, like, was did that fulfill your contract, giving them that last album? Or did they, they just drop you? Not actually. No, they wouldn't drop they us. Wouldn't they drop wouldn't drop us. Drop they you. wouldn't let us go for, mad, for, like, what seemed like a very long time at that time. We wanted to go... We were we were like adamant about not doing any pop record and not putting on any shiny suits and not dancing and doing doing dance routines. And they were like they knew it wasn't going anywhere. We asked to be released from the label Mad Times. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm I'm thinking this is right. I think they released us by fax because that's you had to do shit by fax then. There was no internet um, on April 1st, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, wow. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, right? Wasn't it like April 1st? Wow. Like on some real like twist the knife type shit. And that's what, that's what motherfuckers thought. Like the mentality in the music business and in the psyche of the consumer at that time was if you get dropped from your label or if you end up on an independent label, that's like the graveyard. That's the career graveyard. It's like going to the minor leagues. Yeah, or yeah it's like going to the minor leagues mm-hmm. after being pro. That was just what it was like back then. It's co- completely different now, I, uh, clearly. But um, so at that time, you know, that was the talk, like a high roll over, like what are they going to do? And like we decided to go independent anyway and... Yeah, I mean, because all, like all y'all that were on majors, Casual, Dell, ended up getting out of those situations, and uh, and I feel like by that time, that's when the first hieroglyphics album, group album, started coming into fruition, right? The um, Third Eye Vision. Yeah, but oh, one thing, one thing we got to add in, like the real like straw that broke the camel's back, like the the, the cinder block that broke the camel's back, uh, with all of us ending up leaving our record labels, is be- is we had a song on the soundtrack for the movie Low Down Dirty Shame. And we had a video for that song. And it was f- featured, it had movie clips in it. Casual, I believe, the Casual had a song and a video from the s- same soundtrack. Jive Records put out the soundtrack track for that movie. It was uh, Keenan Ivory Wayne's movie. So, on the premiere, so we were, they were having this big show. Um, so they had the movie premiere, red carpet, all that shit. We're on the record, so we go to the red carpet event. We're sitting mad close in the front or whatever, and we're watching the movie. And um, after the end of the movie, they go to the club where all the stars is at, all the people in the movie, all the um, all the people on the soundtrack are going to perform. I think it might have even been the House of Blues. It was. Yeah. It was the House of Blues. So all the, and and the whole album is all jive people. Well. Uh, one of the performers that night was extra prolific, was a, who was a part of Hieroglyphics at the time, ended up signing the Jive as well. Extra Prolific's album had just come out recently, and they were unhappy with Jive Records at the time. So long story short, it was Extra Prolific's time to perform in front of the Star Studded event. He got on stage like dummy ass drunk and was clowning the, the movie. He was clowning the actors in the movie. He was clowning the other people on the soundtrack soundtrack. All the other artists, and he was clowning the record label, and and like just had, he went on a drunken tirade, and um, they cut the mic off on him and turned on the lights, and he was still on stage with like a champagne bottle, yelling at the crowd, talking mad shit, and we were like, oh my god, this is I can't even believe this is happening. As soon as he got off the stage, it was a wrap. They Casual and Souls of Mischief were still scheduled to perform that night. We didn't perform that night. Um, Foosh was there. Was there? They performed in a bunch of other. Uh, a bunch of other uh, artists from Jive who was there. Extra Pro got dropped from the label that night. Casual got dropped from the label a week later, and then they did they did the drag along thing with Souls of Mischief and dropped us on April first. That's crazy, man. That and that that's like that's how that we. It's funny how we don't talk about that so much, but like we was, it was going bad with the labels. I I think it might have ended differently, or could have ended differently, but that just completely 
that cemented the trajectory in in a whole different way. Like the label was like, we're not fucking with y'all. We it was embarrassing, bro. It was like on a large scale, it, like. It was A-list actors in Hollywood in the house, and like Jive was throwing the party. He he was like that movie we because we just came from seeing the movie in <laughs> the premiere. He was like that shit was mid. He was like that movie was mid. Come on, y'all, y'all thought that shit was funny. I mean, he was on comedian style like roast. He was like roasting the movie. He was like roasting at the record label. It was just like it was a bad look. I could imagine that, like going, it was bad. like you have, like <laughs> when you, when you're young and you get into the music game, you have all these dreams, right? And then your dream comes true, and you have some success. But then as you get deeper and deeper into the business, into the mainstream record industry, it could become a nightmare, and that can be discouraging. And like you said, like getting dropped from a label could be like a death sentence. But I feel like with hieroglyphics. All that energy got channeled into the music and um, and and the determination to bring it back to the Bay Area roots of running shit independently um, with with the label Hieroglyphics Imperium because I feel like after those situations y'all came back together and launched something that that yeah but even bigger just the logo alone the high road you know. Um, and I feel like that that first album, um, there must have been a lot of excitement to kind of put y'all back on the map for for that um, the Third Eye Vision album. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, we didn't realize that was Domino's idea. Like, instead of us, you know, we, we shout out Matt Kelly at High Street Studios, man. Too like we were just like, let's record a record. And at first we were like, we to get signed or whatever, put it out on another label. But then as we started doing it, we started to realize that wasn't the, really the way, you know, and that there were more outlets now. Uh, the first level was like ground level distribution. And then we moved over to Sony with Red and all that. But that we, we didn't need, you use the label really for the money to produce the product. Once we had the product, you know, so it was already sacked up. It's like, well, why, why, why bring this then to somebody who's just going to exploit us? And so... We started doing it independently, and although, I mean, we still had all the the relationships, so we still could go to Rap City, we still could go to MTV, we still could go, you know, we still could. I mean, we started booking shows directly and all this kind of stuff. We were selling. We had our internet. We had our website. It started in '94, right? So we've had a website almost 30 years too. We had a website before probably Apple had a website, you know, or absolutely, and any anybody, right? So. We were selling stuff direct that way, too. But then when you look at the margins, instead of us paying back our budget with $1.39 or what was it, $1.29 per record, yeah. we're going to make 7 or $8 a record, and we're still selling hundreds of thousands of records. I mean, you know, you're going to get a million dollars. You get to a million a lot faster. So it was, it was not as big uh, as far as record sales, but it was way more money like than we had ever seen. And then that's kind of launched... I mean, we, you know, us, us continuing on indie. I mean, think about it. The entire epoch of us being signed to a record label was 1992 to 1994? Five. Five. 1995, right? Us being, we've been independent from 1995 to 2023. So we got 28 years of independence, three years of being right, signed to a label. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? So it's a 10 to 1 factor. You know, like, heck, Whereas the longevity is obviously in the independence, right? You know, yeah. so it's 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 kind of cool that uh, we made that shift, but we didn't realize that it would be such a huge tectonic shift. And then it was at a time where you know ABB was selling records, Get Low and all them was selling, you know, like the moms and pops was buying records, people were buying records. And y'all so, y'all got on the internet early too, right? With yeah, like I mean, website and message boards. Yeah, and, we, 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 we might have been the first rappers with our own website, like out real rappers, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. it, it it made a huge difference because we were able to book shows, we were able to connect directly with our fans. All the things that now social media and all these things do, we were doing that 30 years ago, 29 years ago. Yeah. You know, shout out Stinky, you know, uh, Chris Freeberg, Yamin, like shout shout him out because he really had the foresight to create the website as a fan site and then reach out to us and then shout out friendly traveler for linking us too man uh, Felix Wang Wang and uh, just you know it was a crazy time and it's so hard to imagine not having a website right I mean now it's hard to imagine not having a TikTok right so it 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 
it, this is a time where I remember when email first came out, I was at Stanford and I didn't even have nobody to email. Because who was like, yeah, I'm going to send you an email. So yeah, what, do you need my address? Like, nah, it's electronic. What you mean? You know, like, mm-hmm. so it was, it's a whole different time, whereas now we're getting calls from, you know, our, 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 you walk by a Starbucks and they're going to text you about their macchiato as you walk by. You know, like, it's a whole, jet. we're in the Jetsons world now. Yeah. You know, even, and even that, like, the smartphones and all that kind of stuff. I mean, we, we, like, the smartphones didn't come out until we were in our 30s. You know, so it, when you talk to people about these things, I don't think they realize that these are huge shifts in the way that things happen. And, 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 and I, uh, because it's, it's all regular technology. It's all stuff we're used to right now. But us having a website in 1994 changed the trajectory of our career forever. Us going independent in 90, 1995 made it so that now we're having a conversation about something 30 years later, and it's not about, oh, Vlad, we, I got locked down because I had two kicks. I mean, you know, once after rap stopped, I don't know. We talking about being rappers this whole time. You know what yeah. I'm saying, though? So, so Vlad, Vlad did get it, one of them gun story interviews. I was like, Souls of Mischief interview. And it's like, Souls of Mischief <laughs> remembers being shot at. <laughs> that was at the upper room. That was at the upper room. That's Frisco. That's Frisco. That's Frisco. That's Frisco. You feel what I'm saying? That's why we'd be like, Frisco, that's far. That's hell far, bro. See, he got one of them. He got, one, he got a couple of clips out of y'all, man. It's good, though. He gets everybody. But, um, no, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate y'all coming. I mean, we've been rolling for a while. I could talk to y'all all damn night. I feel like we we got through like half the story. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we, you know, we family. We're running, we're running back, Greg. Man, it's an honor, bro, to have all four of y'all here at once. You know, the energy is present in the building. And again, I'm just I'm gonna say it again, man. The fact that y'all are doing this tour 30 years later, doing it big since this since y'all went independent. Like we talked about, man, y'all been doing this well. You have some of the most hardcore fans in existence. Hyro tattoos everywhere. Um, Hyro Day mm-hmm. is not just a music festival; it's an official Oakland City holiday. Mm-hmm. Um, Hyro after dark. Come on, man! All, all that stuff. You know Come on, Hyro coin. Hyro coin. You know? Man, yeah. Hyro Hyro shop is still rolling. Hyro, like, yeah, you know? yeah, yep. And all y'all have um, solo albums as well. Yeah, um, yeah, a lot, a lot, man. Check out our solo catalog, yeah. man. Look us up by name too, because I really think that in hieroglyphics, the the solo stuff is really good too. So everybody gets the crew albums and the group albums. But when you listen to like, like all three of these dudes' first albums, classics though. Like using the Triangulation Station, you feel what I'm saying though? Like cl- cl- classic though. Like there's stuff on you know with Pigeon John and all this kind of stuff. Or you you know what I'm saying though? I was listening to like I was in Panama. And they were talking about Good Time Charlie and my last good... You know what I'm saying? I'm in a whole different country. And they're talking about A-plus debut album, which now is, what, 20 years old, damn near, yeah. or something like that? You streaming know? is a trip, man. Yeah. It's like you were saying earlier, about as far as streaming, it's like the, the, uh, the paradigm before that was you had to hear it on the radio or buy the product and play it whenever you wanted to in whatever medium that you played at your, at your house. That's the only, or in your car, if you had a cassette shit in your car and then later on CDs. That's the only way people were able to hear music at all. Now, at your fingertips, you can listen to any music from any time from the very second it gets put into the system or anything that's registered as far back as whatever. It's just at your fingertips. And so people are just have access to so much more music it's it's exponentially exponentially unthinkably more music than when it was a hard copy uh transition to, transaction to get music so um that allows for like people's catalogs to be revisited by the whims of whoever tra- happens to find it as opposed to like only being able to be moved by a radio and a uh, record company a spending budget, a marketing budget. Like you can literally just find some music for free just by just stumbling on it. And I think that's that's dope for artists and in um in general, I think for hieroglyphics, people always come back to our catalog little by little. Like we stream more even as individuals as Hyro and as Souls of Mischief, we stream millions and millions of streams. But even as individuals, we have our those streams are in the millions and and stream as well. And it's just because we're always getting new fans all the time, man. So we're just thankful to still be on a wave to where we have our cult following that's getting older and older. But 
for some reason, their kids or their, and, and their nephews and nieces and whatever and whatever movie this has come out in, this comes out in or whatever TikTok goes viral or whatever, we just keep coming up in the con- in the conversation to the point to where we literally just got got off tour. We looking at literal children in the crowd rapping every fucking song, just like mind blowing to even watch, man. So it's just a. Uh, it's a fun ass ride that we just still on, man. And this this comes from a bunch of boys that just love doing this shit from a little ass, just some shit you don't think of. Little ass kids being like, "We finna be rap stars," like just saying it like that too. Literally used to say that shit, and so it's like a it's like a dream, man. You know, so we still on we still on this shit, yeah, bro. Man. This is amazing. Uh, I, I don't I don't see it slowing down anytime soon. Y'all y'all still staying active. Still performing, yeah. yeah I mean, like Uncle shit. Short said, don't stop. Why, why stop? You, if you rest, if really, if you don't even have to, because the whole thing about it, like people don't do this shit if you don't really feel it. Like this ain't always. This is a lot of work, and it ain't fun to do if you ain't wholly interested in it. Yeah. If you're not interested in it, this shit. A lot of the the nuances and details to this shit are a fucking drag. And the only way you do it is if you feel passionate about it. And that's what can be said about most things involving one's passion. But specifically, this this shit is not fun if you don't like it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So no doubt. Uh, we we just we really love the shit, and I think that's what keeps us in the game and keeps us sharp. And uh and we appreciate being here. I think that's a, another a more spiritual side of thing things mm-hmm. that keep us in the game. The fact that we are, we're appreciative to be in this thing that we just was kids loving. You know what I mean? I mean, I think the fact that you know you got Mount Westmore, Short, Ice Cube, Snoop Dogg, y'all y'all out touring. Yes, you were 42. You got, uh, you know, Wu-Tang still touring, Nas still touring. It seemed like a while ago there was like a discussion like there's an age limit in hip-hop or you're too old to be doing this. And I feel like that. That's crazy. That's over with. Everybody you name still makes records though. That's what I'm saying. All that, all that, I'm going to take a hiatus and come back. No, you're not. Yeah, you feel yeah. what I'm saying? No, and don't fool right. yourself. You're going to come back and be hella rusty and niggas going to be dunking on your right, ass. Right, you feel right, what I'm saying? No, right. like you got to keep your knees limber. And that's something that I think it's too might be too late for the older rappers, but for the young rappers, like y'all are not as good as y'all can be. Keep on improving. You know what I'm saying though? Like, and, 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 and you'll get better. This is not a physical sport. This is a mind sport. And as long as you keep reading books and, and, and putting out music and making slaps and all that kind of stuff, you'll be good. Short is at the top of his game. 40 is at the top of his game. Nas is at the top of his game. This, you know, like he's at the top of his game. You Absolutely. feel me? So, so, but that's because he's playing the game. That thing where you think you can take hella years off and then come back in, you're going you gonna to look, your body movements ain't even going to be right on stage. You're going to look dated when you, you know what I'm saying? though, when you do your little, you, for real though, like you see it. I'm like, this is kind of slapping, but you look, you look geriatric on the mic. So you got to keep on ro- rolling with it. That, and that's more advice for the youngsters. Just know that this form that you're in right now is not your final form. And rap is not something that you, you, you can age gracefully at it if you keep doing it. When, if you stop, that's how you fall off. You know, it's like a bicycle. If I stop put, pedaling the bike and I'm not on it at a certain point, it's just going to tip over. You know what I'm saying? And you're going to hurt yourself and then you're going to get back up and be, you know, pedaling funny. So, you know, before you start pedaling funny, just keep pedaling, you know? I, I, be, I believe that we're like in a time and we're not anomalies in, but like we're in a time to where like you can have some classic uh, legacy act motherfuckers appeal to a younger audience mm, and, and music can, and the, the music has been around long enough to be truly classic in the eyes of younger people and I think we just proven that shit I mean I'm not saying it like in a cocky manner at all I'm just saying like young kid, kids are dictating shit we're not out there making marketing schemes and spending ad ad dollars targeting 15 to 25 ers you know what I'm saying? We're that what the fuck? We look weird as fuck doing that shit. You know what I'm saying? We're just rocking our same music, doing the same shit, and we're making new music on our on our terms and shit and whatever. And for whatever reason, our our old classic shit is like the the wave to some young demographics and some young feel some some young vibes and shit. Cause, cause it's it was like, when we made it, probably. Yeah, man. Like, it's just like but then it's also like a gateway drug, you know. Like they re- they they be like, "Damn, you got a big ass catalog," you know right, what I'm saying? Right, but right, they right. don't they don't know that all most people know is '93 Till the album, not just the song. But it, it's the be- song, and then it goes to the album, and then it's like, "Oh, damn, y'all are you know?" Th- when we was on tour. Cats wasn't even knowing we was in hieroglyphics. <coughs> you see what I'm saying though? Like that's how young they are. 
You feel you feel me? Like they just know souls of mischief from ninety three till from this TikTok or from you know from that's, this that's from this crazy. movie thing. That's crazy. And then they're like, yo, so what's this what's this hieroglyphic thing? Oh yeah, that's your crew. Oh yeah. Oh you mess with De- oh the dude from Gorillas. You know, like it's it's a whole bunch of it's they're Algorithm. piecing it together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. It's a bust, but the algo is wild. But it it. it our catalog is really what's keeping us alive. It's not just this one record that's keeping us alive. No doubt. Yeah. No and, doubt. And the streams are, to his point, I didn't mean to interrupt, because you just got me pumped. To, to, to his point, like, um, the streams are on a bell curve. Like, the streams are, the trajectory is up on all the streams of our catalog. Everything. Like, it's, um, it's the kind of thing to where more and more people are discovering this shit organically still. To this day, and it, it just doesn't seem like that's changing, and that has to be testament to how to the trends of how younger people are are whatever's making them stream or whatever algorithms are leading them where we I don't know, but I know the the actual numbers are our streams are always going up, and you know they may spike when we do a tour or, or whatever, but just the trend of them is up, and there's no nothing else to attribute that to uh, except for you know younger like. Not just younger people, but a large percentage of younger people just finding shit and being like, oh, this is what I found. You know what I'm saying? Oh, this vintage shit. You know, it's 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 a trip. But it's because of the advent of modern technology that makes that even possible. So we're, we're fortunate to just be in that lane. We've been fortunate a lot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? What they say, like hard work, Plus preparation is that when lucky shit ha- happens, or I, I don't know, I'm fucking it up. But <laughs> but we just, we put work in and whatever, but we've had like strokes of the hand, the unseen hand, been like, oh, there you go, brothers. Y'all really working hard. Mm-hmm. You know, just wild shit, bro. And there's a lot right. of point y'all could y'all could have quit too and called it a rap. So ah, yeah. fuck this label shit ain't working yeah, that, out. That, that, there was a thought of that. Like, there was some real like bad feelings about how we left the record company. And, yeah. and you know, I'm not going to say we fully entertained that shit, but it was a low time, you yeah. know? Also, like, we we from we have other things that we do, too. Like, we're not too, just rappers. Yeah. Everybody, we all have our own, like, and we. it's not weird to, like, work. Like, I don't know what this notion came where if you're an artist... You don't do no regular work. Like, ain't nothing wrong with having a job. Feed the dream. And, you know, like, and, and I think a lot of artists are making bad. When you hear about dudes going down in a PPP scam and when they get caught up with 50 bricks of fentanyl or something like that, that's because they're trying to live a lifestyle uh, without work. You know what I mean? They're trying to live that same lifestyle but don't have the same opportunities as far as music. So they, so they, instead of saying, all right, let me humble myself or whatever, let me get this job or let me humble myself by scaling back my lifestyle, they start doing shit that they get them caught up. You know what I'm saying? Like, so don't, don't just, it ain't just rap that's fueling all this. We, you know, we've made strategic real estate investments. We, you know what I'm saying? Though we work and do other stuff too. Like, and, and ain't nothing wrong with that. It's not, yeah. nothing weird with that. That's not incompatible with, with that. And, and I think anybody who's trying to sell you on that is, is, yeah. And we tour, like we rap, we don't be on TV. We don't be on the radio. We got a tour. So, but we can tour, like, Earth is vast. You can do a show every night. I mean, we're doing 120 shows, but we could do 300 shows and not hit the same cities. Just in the U.S., you know, worldwide, worldwide. worldwide. Yeah, it'll be rough. It'll be rough. We'd have to bring our families. But but don't don't ever think that doing what's necessary in a square way to take care of your family and feed your musical dream, ain't nothing wrong with that. Any, and anybody who trying to make you feel funny about that, they they busters. You feel what I'm saying though? They they really the squares because they think you're supposed to do some off, you know, some illegal shit or some some, you know, to, just to maintain a lifestyle. Like, nah. I mean, half the reason why the nigga on the block bought the chain is because one day he might have to go pawn it so he could get some money and bread and bust some moves so he can go be back. But you see what I'm saying though? Like there's everybody works. Even the hustlers work. You know what I'm saying though? And and I think that it's a weird, we got artists have this weird thing where it's like having a day gig is is Something wrong with that, you know? Like that. That's I don't. I'll never subscribe to that, and I really won't understand it. And also, in my real regular life, and all I really like, if cats see us doing some regular shit, they be like, "Oh shit, what you doing it? Oh, let me buy da 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 da. You got some music on you right now? You know, it's it's never. What you doing at the grocery store? Yeah, yeah, you know, what I'm you saying? buy groceries too? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's crap. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> but it's, it's never it's never a negative interaction. Even when right, they right. see you in work, even in a in a working capacity in a career capacity that may not be compatible with music. You know what I'm saying though? And then also we've been able to incorporate our creative creativity into the things that we're doing 
outside of music extracurricularly. But I just want to say to anybody listening, like, feed your dream. If it's your dream to do this music shit, this shit don't pay, bro. Like, shows pay, merch pays. The streams can pay if you get into the algo, but most likely you're not going to get into the algo. It's the tip, the iceberg, the part that's popping out, that's making money. There's so much more that's below the, below the surface that's not. So don't feel no kind of way about doing what's necessary to feed your family and to feed your dream and, and keep pushing and don't, and don't stop that shit. Like, I don't, I don't, I'm never not finna have a job. Like, I don't, so like, what? Why? You know, like, if I, if I made hella money off rap, you know, maybe, but like, it, it, it don't matter. I, I, may, I, I make hella fulfillment off rap. I get to travel the whole world with my homies, eat fine cuisine, while out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> do, do, do what's necessary. You know what I mean? Kick it. Uh, I'm talking about me. Anyway, you know, not these niggas. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, but I'm saying, you know, chill. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? No, and count, and have all these kind of new experiences. And we've been able to do that for 30 years straight. So that's success. You know Absolutely. what I'm saying though? Whether or not you see me in a Maybach or you see me flying in on, on a PJ or 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 me having the, the flyest gear, huh? Or a buddy pass. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it's still success. So please, man, for all of those who are trying to make it in this, you gotta define making it for your own for your own self. You can't you can't base it on these metrics because we be bumping into these influencers and we be bumping into all and it's all smoke and mirrors. You know what I'm saying though? So so make sure that you you you're making the music that you want, not the music you think people want to hear, and make sure that you 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 fueling it and doing everything that's necessary to make sure you stay alive and stay up and stay free, because that's more important even than making the music. Well yeah, said. And, and and like that, no matter if you if you love doing this, never stop doing it because I'm telling you. <laughs> continuously making music and and putting it out on whatever scale, whether you blow up or not, and you owning your shit and you putting it up, that shit is like a 401k. That shit compounds like in a bell curve upwards. And if you if you have whether you if you could try your whole life, if you believe you have the talent, go ahead and 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 try as hard and never give up. Because if you do that long enough, try hard long enough, that shit will pay off. It's literally like a 401k. You're gonna get f- checks coming like that the are kids just good. Yeah, you, 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 that just come. I don't even know how to. You never really know how much they are. You're getting like three or four of them a, a, a month out of nowhere. That's just at our level after doing it for thirty years. They just come out of nowhere. Or you could do whatever you got your business is and whatever job you may have outside of the shit. But simply trying hella hard at your dream will amount to some worth at some point. And that's just like, like you again. You really gotta love this shit. It's it's a. Uh, if you don't, if, but if this is your passion, it will pay off. It will pay off for you in the end, whether you get to blow up like fucking Cardi B, or or whether you just a household name, or whatever level that it, it turns out to, it will pay you back. It really will, in, in ways that you can't uh, you can't foresee. But if you're doing it because you love the shit, you're man, successful. yeah, that's and, and, that's success right can there. Can I also add to uh, one thing? I try to measure instead of just money or views or numbers, is the impact it has on people. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. I think sometimes that can be number one, too. You you putting stuff out there that gives people some type of release or some type of inspiration, even if it's just for a few minutes. And that's what I'm trying to do with uh, this podcast and some of the other work I do. And that's why I wanted all y'all here together so people can see what this form of success looks like, that it might not look like they're, you know, the mainstream idea of success, but what you guys just articulated is like exactly it in my book, just being able to do the things you love. And uh, I'm really hoping that there's a lot of younger, and I don't know there's younger youngsters out there watching this that's going to pick up some inspiration from this and hopefully uh, carry, carry this thing on for longer. And uh, I want to give uh, Festo Opio any any final words, man. Any other any other gems y'all want to drop? Yeah, I mean, I want to say, you know, to touch on what you talked about, like the thing with the music, you know, that's why it never gets old for us. Is because like we're, everywhere we go, we get somebody that comes up and they say, "Man, I remember the first time I heard that song." And it got me through a rough time. It got me through, you know, I was, this was happening in my life or that was happening. And, and, it's, and it's a story that we hear 
it's a similar story that we hear. It's a similar thread that you hear, like people going through it. And something about 93 Till Infinity, I don't really know what it is, but the vibe is is it's, it's like a positive, uplifting kind of kind of vibe that helps that brings people through, you know, they whatever they were going through in their life, it helped to provide some kind of um inspiration, some kind of soundtrack for them to pull through that time. So that's like that's priceless. You can't put you can't put any kind of price tag on that at all. So that's really that really taught me the power of music and the power of our words. You know, it's not just, you know, it was just like get on the mic and spit bars and tear rappers' heads off and all of that. But looking back on it, I re- I understand now why that's the song that really resonates with people the most is because we really talking about our friendship on that song. Yeah, we're talking about wilding out and you know, and doing crazy, you know, doing stuff that, that young kids do. But at the same time, the the the, the undercurrent, the theme of that song is is, is a, the, about our bond, our connection, which which obviously remains to this day because we still here doing it. So, um, you know, I mean, I want to just leave everybody with with uh with 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 the you know, I say this in the show with you know our story. I hope what people pull from that is just friendship, connections. What 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 can happen when somebody meets in the sandbox and they still friends? You know. 50 years later, you know what I'm saying? And, and, they, and, and doing something that, that we love to do together, that's priceless as well, but the impact that it has on other people outside of our circle, that's the biggest thing. So shout out to the High Road crew. That's, you know, we souls of mischief in case, I'm going to assume some people don't know who we are. This is OPO, I'm Festo, A+, Tajay, Hieroglyphics, Delta, Funky, Homo, Sapien, Casual, Pep Love, Domino, and DJ Teray. And, um, you know, we are, we are, we are collective. We are, we are a group. We move together. We 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 are each other's kids, uncles, and godfathers, and 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 so on and so forth. And so, I want to leave people with that, and just remember that friendship is a powerful thing. And it's and it's we don't we don't take that for granted at all, at all. So not our fans, our fams, our family. You know what I'm saying? Like th- these are the people that inspired us. Like you said, we could have jumped off. We could have jumped off this boat a long time ago because of the 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 the, the rocky waters and, and uncharted territory that we were going through. But it was really our fans that were like, "Yo, man, let me get a shirt. Let me let me. What's up with the new shit? You know what I'm saying? What's up? You know, that's really what kept really what put the battery in our back. That's what's Opio. up. <laughs> nah, shout out these brothers. You know, um, it just made me think while we was on the road. It was like a young lady that came backstage. She was like, man, I had so much fun. I want to see y'all 60-year anniversary. You know what I mean? I mean, obviously, that's a little, that's kind of, it'd be many if we was really 60 <laughs> years. But my my father just showed me a picture of him and a very close family friend who I call my uncle. And it was just a beautiful picture of them. And, and he was like, this is 50 years of friendship. You know what I mean? And it was powerful. Two, two black men still alive. You know what I mean? And... And it's showing love to each other. And I think that what Festo was talking about and what we talk about all the time is just like the love and the respect that we have for each other is kind of what brought us to this point. You know what I mean? And I, I, even though, you know, we we talking about what we're doing right now, if you look at our Wikipedia, it says, yo, we was active from here until infinity. You know what I mean? And we going to, I feel like that's, that's, that's a testament to what we all about. It ain't no, it ain't, it, it don't stop. You know what I mean? For real. Yeah. That part, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be at least a 40-year anniversary tour. Yeah. <laughs> at least that, man. But for now, I mean, you heard it right here, man. It's 2023. It's 30 years. Friendship, music, doing the things you love, inspiring other people, souls of mischief, hieroglyphics. The whole crew is in the building. And I uh, appreciate y'all a lot for this, man. I hope this is something that people watch for many years and get some insight into into some great artists. So thanks again. Appreciate y'all. And thank you, thank man, you, for putting bro. on for the bag, bro. For real, for real. Like yeah. we're an important region in a very in a very um, influential region, and I'm learning stuff about stuff that I thought I knew about from watching from watching your, your your posts and your and this and 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 all that stuff. And it, it's important that. Like this historical record is preserved, or else somebody else is going to tell a story, and you telling it from within the culture rather than somebody. You know, this is not swamp stories, Bay Area rap. You know what I'm saying, or something like that. This is this actually (laughs) (laughs) shots fire. But yeah, hey, he said it. You know what I'm saying. This is for the culture, by the culture. I appreciate that, Tajay, man. Um, Yeah, this is what we do. This is part of the archive. It's another episode. 
2023 till infinity. Hey, hey, 22. Souls of Mischief, History of the Bay, Dregs One. Shout out to the whole team. Shout out to everybody who watched this. Much love. Peace. Recognize where you got the game. We got our own style, got our own slang. Northern California is a West Coast thing. This is the history of the bank. Recognize where you got the game. We got our own style, got our own slang. Northern California is a West Coast thing. This is the history of the bank.